So I, I want to ask anybody that wishes to speak uh, to come up here to where that mic is so we can hear you. And the meeting is being recorded and you can find it on YouTube uh, probably tomorrow. So everybody's aware. Um, <clears throat> we're going to uh, start off with the agenda here. Um, uh, that was the welcome. And uh, anybody got any other public comment they want to add uh, besides something that's already on the agenda? Not hearing any. We'll move on. Uh, first thing on the agenda is a letter of support for uh, Valerie Valcor. I believe all the board members have seen the letter. And so we need a motion and for me to sign it and we can move forward. This is the uh, draft copies of other board members. Yeah, we already looked at it. Yeah, we already looked at it. Yeah. I move we authorize uh, Brian to sign the letter. Uh, second. Any more discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Standing. Okay. Now we we'll get signed to be out of the way. Yeah. Well, and the next thing on the agenda, um, Scott Smith, donation of the. Uh, quarter acre on Center Road. Um, we gonna... Hi, Ron. Can you hear me? Yes. Welcome. Per perfect. Uh, th thank you for having me and giving me a, a slot within your agenda tonight. And Ron, I apologize for the multiple emails I've sent you over the last three years. Um, do, do you want me to kind of go through the my piece or do you do you have a, kind of an outline that you want to preview yeah. with the rest of the, the yeah. council okay yeah. so that. you can do it really quickly and i think we have the same page here so yeah i can i can do it real fast so there's a, a small parcel of land that was owned by my father-in-law and as it turns out my mother-in-law that i believe was purchased way back i'm going to guess in the 70s um my uh, in law, my in laws both moved uh, to the, to Canada in the nineties, and that this por parcel of land is still being in my father in law and my mother in law's name. Uh, since that time, they've actually got divorced, and my mother in law has changed her name completely. It was Maxine Cloud; it's now Lillian Mills. Um, but the reason why I've been pestering Ron over the last three years is my father in law, John Cloud, passed away. About three years ago, actually, uh, March of uh, 2020. And this, this is part of the estate, and we're trying to figure out what to do with it. Um, so I was hoping an elegant solution would be to gift this uh, small parcel of land to the township. Um, but I understand it's not as easy as just me deciding that, that it's, it has to be something that, um, that has positive value for the, for the town to take ownership of. Um, and we're just trying to figure out the, the least cost effective or the, the most cost effective way to do this and without wasting too many people's time, et cetera. So that, that, that was our proposal is to try and gift this uh, parcel of land. If that can't be done, I still need to change the, the title of it. Um, and my mother-in-law who's still alive she is a U.S. citizen, but a Canadian resident, and my my wife is is also a U.S. citizen, but a Canadian resident. But uh, so, just trying to figure out the the best way to move forward here. I we'd very much like to gift it. It's a piece of land that I don't think that our family will ever get to use and enjoy. So, just trying to get it off the books uh, as I try and clear the estate as the executor of the estate and move forward with it. And I've probably taken longer than I was supposed to. Sorry, Ron. Over to you. <laughs> So we discussed this in last meeting, right? And we were talking about attorney costs and closing fees. Yeah. I, I'm seeing in the literature that they're offering to pay for the fees. Is that we didn't get to that finite answer, but we did get the quote for six hundred to eight hundred dollars for the non-attorney to do their paperwork basically and check check title and mortgage and liens and all that kind of stuff. I didn't get to the uh, back and forth yet with okay. Scott about what 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 the town would pay or not pay or what they're willing to pay, et cetera. So that's kind of where we stopped and said, well, time to go back to the board now that we have that number we were missing. 
and uh, I mean, the, the property tax that we pay is not exorbitant. Um, it's just more of, I don't want to say it's a nuisance, but it's, it's, it's a small amount that has to be paid. And if it, if it's not my father-in-law that's paying because he's passed away, it'll be my mother-in-law. If it's not her, it'll be my wife. Um, so this was just something we were trying to deal with kind of once and for all. The, the, the 600 to 800 cost, um, again, I'm, I'm not a solicitor or a lawyer. It, it seemed larger than I would have anticipated, but um, we, originally we were willing to say we'll pay half those costs just to get this done. Um, but I didn't, if, if you're going to come back and suggest that maybe it should be the whole thing for us, uh, then maybe we'll just kind of re-register it and continue to pay the, whatever it is, I think it's $25 a year. It's not a lot. Maybe it's $35 a year. Just continue to pay the taxes, but need to get it re-registered out of the estate's name. Ron, I remember way back the first time that we talked about this. And we talked about if the town takes it um, because there's a dam and everything. So what are the issues around it? Do we leave it? Is it safe? Do we, what, what there's, value is it to the town? In liability. The, the dam could be seen as liability only in the sense that it's a structure in a wetland class two. So it has permitting issues, obviously, with the stream and the wetlands and maybe even a flood zone. The benefit is that about eight feet south of that dam is the inlet of the a large town culvert. So, so there is some benefit to owning around a large structure only because you don't have to get the easements when you're ready to repair and replace that and probably enlarge that one. That's one of the, that's, I think that's maybe five foot diameter and just downhill of that we put a 16 foot just below that on um, including corners road. So I think, you know, that's kind of what we're looking at, which when the culvert was originally replaced, we did get an easement for that immediate area, but nothing like a 16 foot wide passage under there. So there will, there will be a need to do something with easements that wouldn't be needed. The state of Vermont yesterday announced a grant program to remove dams for a lot of other reasons, 100% paid by state and federal. So I'm meeting with the person in charge of that program at the end of March when the, hopefully the snow and ice leave. Uh, and they said it's highly eligible. Dam removal is a high priority for a lot of state and federal agencies. So from that perspective, I don't think it's a liability on the dam. I think the dam will resolve itself. Yeah. Their suggestion was that because the closeness of that dam to the structure, that it would make sense to design the culvert a little bit at the same time. So that when the work is redone, it's not oh, okay, sure. when the dam is removed, it's either prepared or done in concert with the dam for the culvert project. And they would cover all that cost. And they would write all those design costs to deal with that structure, at least the inlet side. I don't think we're gonna get a free bridge design. They'll at least <laughs> like try to work on to deal with the inlet so that the work is done so that that's ready to go. And I don't we we didn't really get that far than a quick couple of emails, but so that is a that took off one of the larger liabilities or concerns for the town on that. Um, and there's really nothing wrong with having a wider right away in general. It just it has town in more town control over that. And th there really is no public benefit except for the holistic, you know, environmental ecology, fish habitat, those kind of things. There's no access in there. There's no, I guess it used to be historically an ice um, pond when people needed ice for cooling up until the 50s or 40s. So I wouldn't be surprised if that's a historic type you know, structure, but it's not been maintained or anything that I know of. And when I talked to water resources, it wasn't on their radar as, yeah. a, as a site, you know, concern. Yeah. So, and it may just been off their radar, you know, sensitive to private ownership. So half of that, three to $400, would probably be worth it for us to obtain the the They're property. not going to deal with right of ways and everything else. Yeah. Sure, sure. I'm not talking about a lot on the balance scale. Yeah, you know. It's relatively minor on the balance scale. Yeah. As long as it's clear on, we pay half. And yeah, I mean, there's a, there is a, you know, if if the balance, if this went unpaid as a property bill, there eventually would be big enough where they would want to do a tax sale, and that would cost money on that side to do that if nobody bid on it. So that would be a town cost until somebody bought the 25 Point twenty five acres, and, so and that's, that's not a that's not a, a path we really want to go down in terms of not paying our bills. It was a question that I did ask, and I appreciated the 
the answer, but uh, we don't want to be those people that you know aren't paying our taxes. So just we're hoping we could do it in a, so in a, a way that comment more than a you right, comment. Right. Yeah. yeah. So we need a motion. Twenty-eight dollars. Yeah. Well, the, right. yeah. The only motion would be to proceed with the donation process with the town attorney, and the, the town attorney would have a recommendation to do something at the end of that, okay. whatever that process is. I think there's sometimes there's a donation letter that's agreed to. Sometimes there's not. Sometimes it's just a quick claim and a clear title search. Okay. So I, I think at this point. If the board said yes, let's pursue donation, then we would come back uh, with some point to accept the donation. Right. So it's kind of like a two step process. There's work to do in between that motion. So, but you don't want to vote, go for it, spend the legal fees and change your mind either. So it's like, mm -hmm. you can always change your mind. I'm not saying that, but it, it will start a you know, expense path of, of that $800 or less. So, motion to accept the donation. I'll move we accept the donation. Have Ron go forward with seeing what it is. Is he turning? Second, the legal, yeah, legal work. Okay. Any further discussion? Can I just ask that we put a note in there if it exceeds a thousand dollars? The board at least discusses it. For sure. Yeah. yeah. No, not to exceed thousand total for legal with a 50 50 split. Or with it within within a negotiable manner, you know. Yeah. But you said and the 50 50 split is okay. Right. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, it's understood. Should. Yeah. Should. Okay. No, should. But I, Any, I don't want a 10,000 no. bill and then somebody yeah, being like, hey, you guys approved that. Not to exceed. Yeah. 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 It's always good. Any further discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay. Anybody opposed, abstaining? So the ayes have it. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, next on our agenda is an informational meeting on the Forest Hill Residential Care Home uh, change of use. <clears throat> Anybody want to speak on that? Well, do we have someone yeah. from, from the from the, from the program? Because I yep. think that's what we need to hear from first. Huh? I'd also like to make a statement on behalf of uh, myself. Um, I'm one of the property owners and interested parties. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm Jim Levinson, the Home Land and Partnership. Sure. Can you be the developer? And uh, Nicole is here. She's the Home Land Community House. Peter Anderson here is the current owner. Okay. So you want to give it a microphone over there and yeah, so whoever, sure. a couple of you can come up there, two of them. Yeah, yeah. you can move those chairs. But yeah, bring sure. the chairs up. Want to go up there? It's, just, it's for the mic. It's so. more yeah. Yeah. Yes, if you want. Okay. So if you want to comment, you need to be the mic. Sure. <laughs> so we have some information too that we can. I don't know if we got this. Let's see which one. Yeah, we got that. You got that? We like, got, got some of you happy to do. Yeah, I think we have So, um, the Memorial Housing Partnership is involved. Uh, and you've been working with Memorial Community House for quite a long time, and others in the community are trying to find a, um, a long term, more permanent year round shelter to help folks. Out of the homelessness and into permanent housing. And that's been a pretty tough go over the years. Um, currently, the Memorial Community House operates the Yellow, Yellow House yeah. in Hyde Park Village, which has been there for some time now and operating pretty successfully. However, that um, is really an emergency shelter for cold weather. It operates in mid November to mid April. So it's really designed to get people out of the cold weather into shelters so they're not out in the heat and work. Um, this particular program that we're looking at now, um, we've still been looking for a more permanent year-round shelter. And um, the Forest Hill property came on the market late summer. Um, the owners are retiring and want to close that facility so they can retire. And so we looked at it to see what it would do, how it would work for the needs of the community house. And um, 
decided it would probably work pretty well. Um, it's a very similar program, different clientele, if you will. Um, there's really no change in the number of people that would be there. Um, we can provide services on site, um, transport people to where they need services. So um, it'd be a very low well impact change of use um, as far as that goes. So we negotiated an option agreement with the owners to purchase the property and have we went through the zoning process to get the, the change of use approved, which is approved. Um, we've been funded to do the work that we want to do on the property to bring it up code wise, et cetera. And um, we're working on a the Memorial Housing Partner, which excuse me, Memorial Housing Partnership would own the property and um, maintain it and move the master lease it to the Memorial Community House uh, to operate it because that's what we do in that particular. So I can turn it over to Nicole. She can tell you a little bit. Nicole, can you put that mic towards the middle of the table? Sure. Yeah, she can tell you a little bit about how they operate. Thank you. So um, we are what's called a low barrier shelter, which means that we, so I'm just going to read what I have here. Um, the housing first model is endorsed by the National Alliance to End Homelessness. It's guided. It's a guided belief that people need the basic necessities like food and shelter before attending a substance use or addiction type facility. So in order to get people or even accessing like mental health facilities. So in order for people to get in that type of <laughs> space, they need to access the shelter. So our goal is to get people into shelter where they can access those things. And that's that's our goal is get them where we can support them, wrap them around with those services. We'll have access to all those things right in our house. We're gonna have office spaces. We have commitments from all the different agencies, the mental health partners, mental kind of mental health, higher ability, all the different programs are gonna be coming on property to meet with our clients that we'll be working with. They'll be coming there, working with them on property um so that's those are agreements that we came with to um or you know we were looking at any facility that was what we we wanted to be able to provide service um you know something that we've learned over the five years we've been operating in high park village for five years um something that we learned especially through the pandemic is that we were operating out of hotels for a couple of years straight through the summer um, through FEMA funding and FEMA grants. And we found that working with people for six months from November to April and then sending them outside and doing 10 drives and sleeping bag drives, sending them out where we couldn't access them, we couldn't communicate with them and work with them anymore. They lost all the progress that we'd made with them in that six month time. You can't make progress and form relationships with folks in six months. So during COVID, when we had access to people and we were able to work with them on a daily basis, people were making progress. People were doing really well. They were being successful in their goals. And, you know, even this last year when I came on full time at the shelter, we've seen really good progress with folks in, you know, meeting goals that they had set for themselves and accessing housing. And that's really important. You can't just send somebody outside for six months and then expect them to pick up where they left off six months later. So you, you were able to that. work with them when they were at the hotels through COVID. Through COVID. Oh, okay. okay. So, and then that ended for a summer. And then I came on full time last summer and was able to work with people. And it's it's very successful. You, you, you just, you can't do it. You can't send people out. They don't have access to phones or technology. People are not getting the primary care that they need. They're not getting, they're just, they're not able to get mail. They're not able to communicate. They just, they don't have the support that they need when they're out in the woods somewhere. They just don't. So it's just really important that, we keep that those those supports there for folks. They need that. So having a year-round shelter is just really important to to build those supports. It also helps with a continuum of care, if you will. So that yeah. the idea is people are in crisis when they're homeless. They have yeah. a place to live. They don't know where the next meal is coming from. They yeah. they don't really have anything. So. Um, that creates trauma to them. And so if we can get them out of the crisis mode into yeah. a secure uh, mode where they, they can start getting the services and move forward with their lives, um, as we at the Memorial Housing Partnership are building new uh, buildings, we're setting aside units specifically 
for permanent supportive homeless um, folks to keep them on that continuum. Right. So we're really looking for um, a way to help folks not keep bouncing back and forth but to get them into a secure location. They can get the services they need, they can get healthy and keep getting healthy. Some people have jobs, they just don't have a place to live. Other people need a job, but they need a place to live to get a job. So we're, you know, this will help to smooth some of those transitions out. Give people the, you know, the year, 18 months if they need it to, to really get what they need and start moving here. Um, our goal is to have successful citizens in our communities, not people bouncing back and forth in the homelessness. Do you serve families? Um, we do not. Um, so the typically um, we serve anywhere from eight, we've served people anywhere from 18 to 80 within our shelter in the last five years. Um, so the traditionally the GA um, hotel funding still um, supports the families just because it's a little bit more private. Just they can still have their own. Yeah. Oh, so kids are yeah in the separate areas, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's pretty important. Yeah. Right. Those kinds of things. Yeah. 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 I'm saying you're going an 80 year old. Yikes. Okay. Yeah. So um, so we were finding that more and more the homeless issue is getting big. And yeah. for a lot of reasons, including even nowadays, we're finding we get calls all the time from folks who have been renting families renting a home for years and some are now because of COVID migration, which you've probably seen, and now private migration. Um, properties are selling for a lot of money, and people who've been renting those homes are having to be someone buy new homes because they've been renting and they're getting kicked out. Um, people are buying properties and turning them into short term rentals because they can make more money. So the people who have been living there are losing their housing, um, including older folks, which is a real shame because we're talking. Even you know, people who are losing their housing. Um, I'm not sure what I would do if I were to lose my housing at this point in my age. But um, those things are real and they're happening, and we're trying to do the best we can to keep finding people homes and working them back into housing. We got, we got a question that we're back. Okay. You, <clears throat> your intent is to fill this home with 80 year old people that lost their housing? I'm so sorry. <clears throat> So your intent is to fill this with eight, you just said 80 year old people who have lost their housing. So I guess that my question is, is that what I should expect? To uh, I use that like, as an example of that yeah, was my question was I was surprised to hear that an 80 year old person was not housed and he was just responding to my question. He was not saying they're filling it up with old people. So I just thought uh, okay, uh, so my, my actual first question. Was what is the revisitation rate, I guess, of, of people that will be checked out of the shelter and then come back? Um, that's, I mean, because we haven't been year round before. But those numbers must be publicly available to an organization like yourself. We there must be an average available number of. of that's not something I have. It's something I can write that down, and we are having a public meeting on the 10th. There's flyers there, and it's something that I can definitely write down and we can look into. Um, it's not something that I personally, we have the data for for this county because we haven't been year round to know and to be able to support people year round in this county. I have a question. Wait, 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 wait just a second. Brian, do we want people to ask questions or let them finish their presentation first and then? <laughs> I think they're able to cut down on some of the time. Answers. So, so, so I'd like yeah. to see them finish their presentation yeah. and, then and, and then we'll open it up for, for questions. Yeah. So, so maybe it'll answer some some of everybody's questions. Right. We just so the goal and the our program that we are um, going to be providing is majority of services will be provided on site, but there will be some that cannot be, obviously, just because. Um, we have, uh, at this point, we have a three-fold um, transportation system that we have created. Um, RCT is creating their microtransit um, 
new Riker Transit system that is coming into, and we are going to be on their route. So we've worked really hard with them. Um, so we will be one of their stops on the route. Um, we have gotten a grant for some e-bikes that we will be having that we will be able to loan out to folks. And we just got um, awarded a $60,000 grant last week that we will be using to purchase a van. And we will be making um, planned scheduled trips into town to like go to the pharmacy, grocery store. Um, people can also use it if um, they're unable to access RCT to go to like a doctor's appointment that isn't able to be accessed on site or is in another location. Um, we'll be able to have um, staff on call that can take them to an appointment or if somebody is needing shelter late at night and isn't able to get there, they can call and we'll have somebody that can go and pick them up. Okay. So, so um, I'm gonna reduce my age significantly. Uh, so I'm a 50 year old homeless female mm -hmm. um, and I get referred, I come to you. Mm -hmm. What then would sort of my program look like? And part of that, I'm getting the value of, am I in and out, am I in and out? Which of course with a nightly shelter is very different. It's how often, but if I come to you now and you're 24 seven, what, what's gonna happen with it? So, for me, with me? So we have a housing navigator that is currently me, but it will not be me when we go year round. It will be somebody else. Um, and you will work with the housing navigator to um, come up with your housing plan, fill out applications. Um, we will develop a more intense plan when we become year round. It's really hard to develop a really intense plan in six months. Um, budget type stuff. Um, some of it is on here, I think. Um, making sure people have, I don't know if it's actually all on here. Um, so, you know, a lot of things that people don't have um, that require in a lot of housing applications is birth certificates, social security cards, photo IDs. We make sure and help support and have funding to make sure people have those. So a lot of time I spend making sure folks have those things. Um, we make sure we develop um, housing histories with folks so that they have all those things. Um, you know, we have definitely have a criteria. Um, we send out referrals to um, different agencies like employment agencies. And um, like I said, we have, we work, we will be having higher ability come in and then we've been working with um, Working Fields. It's a new um, staffing agency that's been working its way into the area as well. Yeah. So yeah, so we'll, we're still kind of developing what is the extent of what that will be just because it's still. So, so the benefit will be that I'll be there and yes. I'll be there 24 seven. That will that will become my home for yes. X amount of time. Yes. While you get me organized, coordinated, everything yes. put together, hopefully with the job or whatever it is. Yes. And then hopefully working with Jim's organization, you get me permanently housed. Either Jim's agency or with a Other private. people that do it. Right. Correct. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, one of the biggest questions I've had from taxpayers mm -hmm. to ask me, and I don't know. Yep. Yeah. Do you keep this with people just in Lamoille County or do you go to Rutland? Do you go to Bennington? Do you go to Barrie and bring them into Lamoille County or how's that work? Outside of state. Yeah. Um, we don't. So I would say the majority of our folks are from, are from Lamoille County. Um, majority. Majority. I mean, I can't, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that, that we don't have folks that come from out of county because they're referred to us from economic services from the state because other places are full and they don't have anywhere to go. Do you have from out of state? No, we do not have people that come from out of state. And not taking them from out of state. <clears throat> um, well, if they're homeless well, and back here, then yeah, I was say, the door. Right. I mean, well, right, exactly. Yeah. I, I heard one at a time, please. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's I, never I, happened. I was asked, yeah, do they go and truck them into? No, 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 oh. no, no. Nobody's ever been. I mean, somebody can like be that. walking through. No, 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 no. That's I mean, never happened. Okay. I've had that question when we're yeah. developing a well, house. We've had people yeah, say, that, that is that has never happened. Okay. We, we no. don't, At least I can we don't give no. the answer. Yeah, that's that's right. Again, never so, happened. Yeah, what we're trying to find out and what we're hearing from people and no. give you all the opportunity and the folks that are here to ask all those things that you hear and yeah, you know, yeah. oh no, we're trucking in druggies from no. Massachusetts. No. They go, no, no, that's not what we're doing. 
there are lots of reasons why people want to move to the Moyle County. And those, there's jobs here, there's economic opportunity here. So the national media has decided that Memorial County is the best place to go to escape the um, climate change. Um, and people respond to those things. I will tell you that in order to qualify for shelter, somebody has to meet the HUD definition of literal homelessness. So we do have a screening that people have to do before they even come to shelter. And we have a we have a form that we have to go over and the HUD definition of literal homelessness is gone over with them and they have to meet that in order to qualify. On your meeting on the 10th, is that screening process shared? I can share it for sure, yeah. I think that would help. Yeah, yeah. So, and even if somebody if somebody's staying with a relative or a friend and they can't stay there any longer, we, we do ask that we either speak to them or they bring something from them that says that they can no longer do that. So that is, there is a screening process in order to access shelter. So that is something that, that happens. <laughs> You have, you have more to say. I, unless so, somebody has a so question. A bunch of stuff got brought to me. Okay. So sure. mm -hmm. uh, let's say let's say I'm a local neighbor. Mm -hmm. I, I, you, you guys mentioned the no change in the situation of what it was. Now, I might live on that road. I might not. But theoretically, somebody that was 80 years old probably didn't travel the road more. So you're saying more RCT, more bus. Obviously, we are going to see more traffic on that road. Um, I think not. We did a study compared to what traffic there is now. Did that include foot traffic? We had bikes. We as well had residents who would walk. Okay. So we also house residents from 55 to our oldest was 107. I can't imagine too many. So, too much walk. Um, actually, quite a few of them do. Well, you have a long road driveway that they walked on, right? We had, quite a, we had quite a few who enjoyed our property as well as walking down the road. We had one gentleman who actually walked all the way over to Charlie Hill and then walked all the way around to get back home. So we have had residents at Forest Hill who enjoyed walking for our residential care. We're not a nursing so our residents were able to ambulate and go out and, and I'd like to take, take a moment and uh beth was putting her hand up wanting to talk you're on lady on the i can't see your last name preston beth, beth, yeah beth preston you're muted <clears throat> <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm having some Zoom issues. I, I, I didn't. I, I will have a question. I don't have one at this time. Okay. I, I didn't raise my hand. Saul has a question, and Aaron. Aaron, I, uh, I actually have a short statement that I'd like to read, if that's okay. Take about two minutes. Okay. Um, so my name is Saul Costa. I'm the owner of 944 Center Road. So my property borders uh, on the property under discussion. Um, I purchased this home back in April with the hope of one day raising a family there. Um, I thought I had found a safe space uh, for my future children to play in the woods, as I did growing up in Lamoille County, and as I know many other children do in the area today. But it appears that the safety of my future children, the existing families in this area, and myself is already at risk. In other places in Vermont where this type of housing uh, described in permit number 2022-71 has been instituted, it has created cesspools of crime that leak out beyond the borders of the permitted property. If the proposed facility is open in Hyde Park, people dropped off here will stumble through the surrounding woods, our land drunk yeah. and high. Drug deals will be conducted in the shadows of the trees. Tents will fill the once serene forest, scaring away precious wildlife and robbing a beautiful area of everything that makes it special. We need to address homelessness in Vermont. There is no denying that. I live primary, primarily in California for the time being, so I've seen firsthand how bad things get when this issue is not addressed properly. However, this appears to be nothing more than an opportunistic land grab, not a well thought out solution. This is not the place for this type of facility, not even close. Given the dangers that this facility presents and the fact that I and other interested parties were not properly notified of the permit application, I request an immediate repeal of permit number 2022-71 
so that we can save this wonderful, unique, and cherished space in Hyde Park for those who will respect it. Thank you. Thank you. I want to ask one okay, question. Okay, question. So, <clears throat> can I just ask you where you think the right place would be for the shelter? Not in the middle of the beautiful forest. The fact oh, that you weren't able to find land elsewhere is not the problem of the residents and the nature that you'll be destroying by placing this facility there. I can I my question is you talk about where these sorts of programs have been located. The world has deteriorated into drugs and cesspools. Where are those programs you're talking yeah. about? There are specific examples of similar programs instituted uh, in Barrie, especially. And I know that there is a difference between those types of programs and what's being proposed here. But the general idea of bringing in people, especially when there's no barrier of clean, uh, uh, you know, no drug use, no drinking beforehand, I think is pretty indicative of the fact that it will immediately turn into a similar type of situation. I do not see or hear any types of guarantees being put forth about ways that the surrounding area can be protected from residents who are out to walk around and do whatever they want. They're already going to be walking down roads. There's no reason that they can't walk the, you know, few hundred feet into the uh, surrounding woods and start doing whatever they want there. Are you aware that there's currently a shelter in the Hyde Park Village and there has been for five years? I am not, and that's fine. Keep it in the village, not in the middle of the woods. I'm not speaking to you right now, sir. Oh, um, sorry. Um, so I just wanted you to be aware of that. So there's no tents in the village, and you know, just so you know, you might maybe you could talk to you know, some residents in the village and see how, if they've had any bad experience. I think that especially in an area that's rural like this, where it has the uh, surrounding area where you could pitch tents, it's likely, likely we'll see that cropping up here. Didn't even okay. see you back there. Sorry. <laughs> if, I could just, if I could just add to that, um, this is Beth Preston. I live at 658 Center Road, which is directly adjacent to the, to the property. Um, and I, I will, I have seen residents that have kind of wandered onto our property have uh, current residents um, that have, you know, scared my children at times when they've been outside. Um, I guess my biggest concern is I received a notice in the mail that was very cryptic that talked about a crisis care facility that with no definition of what that meant. Um, it came in the middle of the holiday season with a hearing on January 3rd, which I was not able to attend. Um, and suddenly this seems like it's a done deal that we now have two weeks to appeal. Um, and it just, it doesn't seem to me like it's been very well thought out that it's been very opportunistic in terms of how this has been managed. Um, and to just echo Saul's concerns, I just, I, I'm curious to understand what safeguards will be put in place for the adjoining properties. Um, you know, will there be requirements that residents must, you know, will they be restricted to certain areas at times if people are abusing drugs? Are there, you know, what is the, what is the plan or what is the um, requirements in terms of uh, remaining housed at the facility? Um, again, I don't, I just, it does not seem to me that this has been well thought out. I know you referenced that there's a homeless shelter in the, in the village, which is fantastic. I agree. Homelessness needs to be addressed, but it seems to me that it would be more successful if it's located closer to areas where services are readily available, where there's access to transportation, to businesses, where it's not an effort to get down Center Road. I, I know you say that it's just a mere less than a mile, but it's a very busy road. There are no sidewalks. Um, e-bikes, you know, I love e-bikes, but they don't seem to be the most viable of options when there's snow on the ground or when the weather's inclement, as it often is in Vermont. So. Um, you know, I'm, I guess I'm just ex expressing my disappointment in um, how this has been managed so far. Um, and, you know, I, uh, I'm just interested in the appeal process. Can, can I ask you a question? Sure. Do you still have that letter that was sent to you? Um, I, I, would I, would actually... like a copy. I would like a copy of that myself. Just to the top. Just, yeah. just a notice that was sent here. It was in your packet. I was going to say. I don't yeah. remember seeing it. It must have been that one. I didn't. The big packet we got today. Yeah. The permit. Oh, it's in this one we got today. Oh, today. Yeah. 
Yeah, there's two two notices that went out. One was. I'd like you to come up, uh, Officer Watson. I'd like you to um, maybe talk on your experience with the current shelter. Uh, first of all, let me apologize for Roger. He planned on being here, but he had a prior commitment with his kids, seeing as it is school vacation week. <laughs> what I have uh, in front of me are um, a total incidents with what we call the yellow house from the first of the year to today. We have removed three tenants. Um, we have dealt with four tenant slash staff disputes. We've had one reported theft. We've done seven citizen assists, which basically consisted of giving people rides when they needed rides someplace, explaining court paperwork that they may have been served, stuff like that. We've had one mental health incident and we've had one service of paperwork. In that time period, um, we have had, our total calls in Hyde Park have been 2,729 calls for service. So um, it's, it's a pretty small number for us, but I also think that it, it helps that we are right across the street. Yeah, I'm sure it does. Um, can you speak to anything about uh, some of the current ones that are being housed in some of the motels, Lake Shalmont? I mean, uh, Sunset? I can't. Okay. No, I don't have any or do you, Yeah. Okay. Sunset. I didn't know if you had any, any information yeah. on that. Yeah. Yeah. I can, I can speak on that to some degree as a correctional officer, um, CCO in, in this county. We do uh, visit those sites, and these people I'm Pretty sure you're talking about are the ones you want to invite because their funding is going to be ending and and you want to invite them into your uh, in your facility and uh, um, we've had quite a bit of interaction with those and we've had some over to the the yellow house and uh, uh, working there as well so my my one of my concerns would be is um, how do we continue to properly interact and how do we uh, uh, resolve those issues uh, as they come up. Is it going to change? Any of the policies going to change since they're going to be full time residents at the home? You still have to abide by the rules of the house. Yeah. Right? And, and can they use drugs or alcohol while they're there? No. No, I'll be clear on this. How do you screen that? If somebody comes back in, uh, have you had special training? Officers have special training to identify people with uh, with drug, uh, you know, how they look, how they appear, how they interact with people and stuff like that. Do you have anybody like that? Um, we have done training with um, substance use counselors from the recovery center, and we will continue to, to train more when we become year round. We will definitely enhance that training. Um, when we go year round, we do um, have curfew policies within our house. The doors lock at a certain time and unlock at a certain time, and people are not allowed outside during those, you know, those hours. We will have cameras on the property, inside and outside, um, like the other property did. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, this, how this did they miss their curfew? Yeah. If they miss their curfew, yeah. Um, we are we going to leave them outside? Is that what you're asking? They missed their curfew. They didn't get home in time. So, are you asking if we're going to leave them outside and hold? He's asking what happens if they miss their curfew. Right. Yeah. What's your response? If I'm supposed to be in by eleven o'clock and I'm not there, what do you do? If so somebody. If the homeless guy stumbling over to the neighbors? No. She, she's trying to answer your question, yeah, sir. So Please give me the opportunity. Are you asking if we're going to leave them out? We will not leave them outside. Um, so we do have people that work jobs and they have to come in later than 11 and we ask that they call and let us know. We have had people that have been out because their car broke down or they have been, you know, out for some reason. And we ask that they call and communicate that with us and we, we will let them in. We don't leave them outside, you know, just sleeping wherever. We don't, we don't do that. So that sort of precedence is set. It doesn't, it doesn't does it deter them from coming in late no. later on? No. It just it Usually just, behaviors that are dismissed or not addressed, then they continue. It doesn't happen. Okay. Sir, you wanted to... I have two questions. One for... Uh, it was Sheriff or Sergeant? Sorry. Sorry. 
How many of those calls, the 3,000 calls, were to forest or residential care? I don't think any of them were. Um, and for you, back to the drug screening, they can go into town, do drugs, and come back and check back into their room, or they'll have to pass a sobriety test coming back. I mean, people, I mean, anybody can do drugs, anybody, your neighbor, anybody really. Yeah, but my neighbor has their own place to do that. Right? So they're not being moved into next door to me. And that's the difference. And my question is very simple. Do you have to pass a drug or alcohol screening to come back into the facility? We we used to do um, sobriety so tests. I, I do apologize. It is a yes or no. Do you have to pass a sobriety test to come back into the So I'm, I'm trying to answer that. So we did in the pre-COVID, we used to do breathalyzers coming into the house because it wasn't safe during COVID to have people going into breathalyzers. We did stop that. But it's this is all new. We haven't discussed if we're bringing that back yet. Um, it just it wasn't safe to have people going. But they room. are not allowed to drink or do drugs in the house. No, and it's not it's not even allowed on property. Do you do you search the property when they come in so you ensure they don't have drugs or alcohol with them? Um, we have actually called the sheriff's office to do property searches. They they can't search people's property. No, they do not. They have they do not search the property. We call them for support and we search the property. We just have them there in case anything. The department can't search people's property without their consent. We it is in our it is in our policy that they are allowed to search property. The they don't search. can't search their property that, because you guys said so. If they don't want the property searched, they don't touch the property. The police officers don't touch it. We search it. So that's what I'm asking. So you do you search we, property? We, we we have it we have it in our agreement that we're allowed to search our property at any time. Correct. Okay. But that's not done as a standard thing. If we feel like we need to, we can do it at any time. But we don't do it every time. You feel like you guys do a good job of catching drugs and alcohol? Um, we we caught. We caught it and actually uh, several people to get your Yeah. I'd like to speak whenever it's my hey. no, I, I, I also would like to have more than just one question at a time, and I'd love for you to go so, first. So go ahead. And, yeah. Uh, would you like to come up? Yeah, yeah, come on up. Get you off the hot seat. Yeah, Thank, thanks, you, <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Uh, my name is John Marcoux. I've been a police officer in this county for 12 years. Until recently, I was um, injured on duty. Um, I have experience working on shift, backing up sheriff's deputies at the Yellow House. Um, and I I feel like what is being portrayed as the ideas of this new project are not anywhere near what the actual factual experiences of the some of the situations and incidents are. So for example, um, you know, it was very common that the people were getting completely intoxicated at the Yellow House to the point where people were dragged out, you know, by an ambulance, were taken out by ambulance because of intoxication. And I remember the BACs of these people, and I'm not going to get into that. It's a technical thing, but these are extremely high BACs of people. So now we're being told that this isn't going to happen or that this isn't allowed, but th these were people that were so intoxicated, they were taken out by ambulance. So I don't think that's exactly lining up with what, you know, being shared here. Um, also, I think it, I, I know um, Sergeant Wash, Watson um, gave you the stats for the last 60 days, approximately 60 days, but I would like to see the, the town request the Freedom of Information Act on the last the five years that they've been there, because um, I don't think the arrests are representative in the last 60 days of what some of the incidents have been over over the last five years. Because, again, I'm very aware of arrests that occurred there, um, you know, violent arrests, you know, violent incidences that occurred there. How in, long ago? In the last five years. I got the last five years. I can, I, I don't have I can a attest to one. That's why yeah. I can attest to one year on some of it. That's too. why I would like to request that or have the town request that information so that we have an accurate, you know, representation of what, what that is and how often it has happened. Sure, we have for it. Don't give it to yeah. That's something that's really, really easy for us to do. Yeah. Just yeah. give us a time period and, and it will take me a couple of hours to compile that information. About 7 30. <laughs> I made that request when I didn't get all the information. One of the one of the things that I know experience with staff was just overwhelmed by people. Like as you guys all spoke to, these people are in crisis. Um, they are intoxicated at points. Uh, they, they, you know, they they need help, but staff gets overwhelmed because they're you know maybe there's just two of them there. Um, you guys reference driving people to town, so does that mean you're going to leave one person at the facilities so they're by themselves? Um, and I do know that, you know, there's many people from outside our community, our local community that stay at these shelters. I dropped them off there myself. 
Um, the reason I know that is because I know I've dropped off people with out of state license, driver's licenses before. So I don't know how they're where they're getting here from, but at the Yellow House, but th that does happen. There are out of state individuals that have stayed there. Detox or anything? You don't take them there no more? Well, detox is a, the state is trying to get away from detox. That's, you know, unfortunately, that's not always the option we have. The, we don't always have the, we don't ever really have the choice. Lamoille County Mental Health, you know, decided when people go to detox and, and not, not the police department doesn't make that decision. Right. Yeah, they have the authority that we have to get the sign off from them to go to detox. Um, so my and, and also along these lines, I know there's going to be, you know, people with criminal histories, criminals there. Um, and that's not to say that criminals are bad. I, I, you know, interact with criminals for over 12 years. They're not bad people. Some of them aren't bad people. Some of them are bad people. Um, this includes like offenses like sex offender offenses. Um I know that I can't speak to exactly the yellow house, but I know that in some of the, uh, the homeless shelters, there are sex offenders that live there. So now we're talking about intoxicated sex offenders being in our community next to people, you know, next to where kids live. And it's, uh, you know, it's, a, it seems to me like a bad co uh, combination. Um, I have, you know, I have some other things, but I'd rather give the time up. I don't want to take a lot of time. So if I can provide any uh, help from this perspective of dealing with the more, you know, I guess, uh, you know, more troubled side of the of the uh, equation from my experiences, I'd be happy to provide that. Have you had an opportunity to deal with folks that have been living in a 24 seven situation? Because I think part of the part of the issue for all is it's not just the yellow house, it's any place. But when it's just a winter time, you get there at five o'clock mm -hmm. and you got to be out at eight in the morning. Yep. You think there's a difference in the kind of programming you can do with folks that are well, as you guys talked about, the, yeah, or if you're there, sure. or if it's, the, uh, oh. the Sunset Motor Inn in Morrisville has been housing uh, homeless people now for several years through the COVID pandemic, and so they're there. You know, I don't know what their terms are, how long they're allowed to stay there, but they're not forced to leave during the day. They have a, right. a room, and uh, the amount of times I, you know, uh, the amount of times we get called there for trashed rooms. Uh, you know, just the vandalism inside the the rooms is is crazy. People barricade themselves in the room all the time. Right, um, but that isn't a program. It's just people being housed. It's a it's a twenty four seven. Well, but it, it housing is twenty four seven housing. Right. But there is no one super. They are sure, responsible. Sure. Nobody supervising. It's just taking people. But right potentially, it is the same people that will be at this program. The same. The but same. They're type. totally unsupervised. So they know they have right. staff. They do have staff that's there that's supposed to be supervising them. Part what do you mean? The house, the mom and Nicole was there. That, but that was we haven't been there for 22 years. Okay. okay, there was staff there at one point. There was, is there not? No, so there there's there. never, no, no, I'm not saying no. in the last two years no. there was never staff there. Yes, there was staff there. Okay, in so the in the beginning of FEMA, yeah, when, when that ended, we stopped. When and I'm I'm pretty sure that you can probably check with the sunset when we were there and we were staffed there 24 seven there was minimal issues and when we stopped I would I would disagree with that and I could I can testify to the fact I, I can testify to the fact that while there's people while there was staff there we responded for multiple incidents yes. the staff would normally escort us to the room and show us exactly where the problem was so there was staff there no questions about it Thank well you. it's asking him about it because he's still housing them. What's that? They're, Jeff is still housing all those people. So I don't, yeah, that's Jeff's do. personal money. They don't do it. Monetary decision, yeah. though. Huh? Can't be yeah, they still do. They still, they still do. Still do. Still yeah. But what, what Jeff decides to do, I don't feel like should be enforced on the residents of Hyde Park. I mean, we shouldn't be the same. We don't get any money from it. So, you know, if you're paying, if you're paying the neighbors, that's one thing. But he's making money off of it. We're not. We're not profiting off this at all. Mr. I feel like it's only a negative. So. Frederick, did you have Thank a you. question? Yeah. Thank you. Do you want to? Can I get your name, please? Tell the chalk mark. Uh, it's, uh, I find it over there. I'm not thrilled about it, and I know there's nothing you can do about it, and I agree, because it's on my road, it probably bothers me more. But one thing that really I think needs to happen is somebody's got to pay for lighting from Morseville to that road all the way up, and the road has to be widened for safety that's i don't see what there should be an impact study because the road is narrow and it's dark going through the pines and i don't think it would cost a lot to put lights down through but i don't think that we should have to pay for that 
I, I just think it would be safer for everybody, including people walking, somebody driving, somebody walking, at least you did. No. Yeah. And yeah. that's about the only thing that I can come up with that would be logical. But I think you're right. Well, lit areas are always safer. And it should be wider. And well, we should repress that the more still paved the rest of the road to make it safer. Okay, that would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> we did our part, Eddie. <laughs> Thank you, Ed. Okay. Somebody else had you had your hand up there. Thank you. I come up? Yes, please. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lucy Larish. I'm in a butter. Um, I uh, I'm on Larish. I'm uh, off of Trombley Hill Road on Larish Road, and my property abuts like the backyard of the facility. And I'm just here to voice my support for this shelter. I think it is really important that I mean we our community is full of people who have needs, and I you know what are we going to do? Throw people in a snowbank? I mean I feel like it's really important. That we um, that we do what we can for our population, and I feel really um, comfortable and grateful for the services, the wraparound services that are going to be provided here. I feel like the list. I, I really love that it's going to be staffed, and that people are going to be moved from from how from um, homelessness, hopefully into permanent housing. And I know that not everybody does that, and that some people flunk out of the program. My sister was one of those people. I just like to share that story very briefly. My sister has um, a traumatic brain injury from falling out of a barn when she was six. She um, developed mental illness and severe substance use disorder. And she is currently, she um, seeing her suffer through the years has caused me great distress. And I've not wanted, I wanted nothing more than to see my sister in a safe place. And I wish that this kind of facility would have been available for her. She is alive. She's in a nursing home now. And I am grateful for that because she is supervised and safe. Um, and I do think that a facility like this would have really helped her. And I do think that if we search our hearts and if we search our family trees, we have these, we have folks. These are these are our families, these are our neighbors. Like um, I just don't think it's right to turn our backs on our community. And I'm just here because um, I have also had these thoughts, well, what if they go in the woods and come up to my house? But guess what? They might, but we'll deal with it. You know, we'll, we'll just deal with it when it, and if it happens. But I have very, I have all, from what I've heard tonight, I have a lot of confidence that this team will um, provide the services and will be responsive. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. And the man, lady in the back, and then you're next, sir. We have a couple online too there. Yeah, okay. okay. I'm Anna Kern. I'm on the board of the Memorial Community House, and I have been since the beginning when it was a priest and a rabbi and a sheriff deciding to open the churches to let people stay in them overnight. Um, we have since, in the five years, professionalized as an organization and made huge strides in our programming and our training for staff and the way that we interact with guests. So the only point I wanted to make was about who comes to the shelter and who stays in the shelter. Right now there are in Lamoille County, 164 adults and 51 children experiencing homelessness. We have 10 beds in Hyde Park. We're going to have, if everything goes according to plan, 21 beds in at Forest Hill. So people who are, we kind of, not everyone is successful in shelter and not everybody can live in community and follow our rules and be polite to the other guests and clean up after themselves and participate in programming. It's not for everyone. So of the 165 people, there are only 10 to 20 who are at the shelter and they are the people who are successful at being at shelter and the ones who are not successful and living in community like that, like I would probably be one of those people, um, They there's other options, hotels, other programming that's available. So that's kind of the idea of who's there. The other thing about who's not there, 
families and children, which um, has been a really hard thing for everyone who's volunteered for the shelter or been a part of the programming from the beginning. Everybody wants to serve families, but um, we learned it's not best practice to, which is kind of a duh, to have a bunch of families sharing a bathroom in a kitchen. Like it's hard enough for one family to share a bathroom in a kitchen. So having families in their own spaces, which is uh, right now hotel rooms, is what works best for kids and families trying to work out um, their 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 situation. So I just that's that's uh, that's what I wanted to add. Yeah. So of the the people that don't fit into a program that it doesn't work for. So where are they? Are they more apt to be the ones camping in the woods and showing up on the doorstep or wandering around or the police are picking up or do we have any? I mean, I know it's hard because you don't deal with them, but it's like, that's a whole bunch of people to yeah. deal with it. Yeah. I mean, I think the question is like, who comes to us and who do we kick out? Right. So we don't we don't go around rounding up people in and bringing them to the shelter. People are referred to the shelter or people call the shelter or people show up at the shelter and then they go through this really long kind of two day screening process. Okay. Right. Yeah. But then like, yeah, like we're not we're not going out and, you know, giving out invitations and inviting people to come to shelter. They're usually referred to us by other agencies. Capstone is the lead housing agency in our county. They refer people to us that go in there that are being, um, you know, losing their housing for various reasons, um, you know, landlord selling, different reasons like that. Um, or they're sent to us because they um, are being discharged from the hospital or, you um, it could be that they, you know, they call us themselves, you know, for, you know, they've been staying with a friend for a while and they just can't anymore for, you know, like I said, but we're not going out. But we do do, I mean, Nicole does outreach with, you know, if I you do. see people who are- If I see at, people somewhere that looks like, you know, I do a lot of that. In schools, like just like to, um, sometimes the teacher <laughs> now, like- Sometimes so, people feel that out, you know, you kind of know. We, we have had people that, um, you know, like I said, we do, we're 18 and older. Um, mm -hmm. We have had, well, we have had people that are referred to us from the homeless, uh, from the schools that are 18, from the schools that um, oh, right. yeah. we have, we have had that, um, we have had that yeah. for various reasons right. that, you know, I can't get into. But exactly. Yeah. That yeah. has happened. I can imagine. Um, yeah. <laughs> so. Okay. Then the state program, McKinney Vento, I think it's called. Yeah, the McKinney Vento. It's for kids. So the school, they identify a family that they think, or kids that might be experiencing homelessness. There's a state program. Oh. Okay. And then that funnels yeah. into hotels. Oh, okay. And it's and, and a separate program because it is kind of okay. a specialized population. Like we decided early on, like we have to pick what who we're going to serve because it's really different populations. Okay. And because there was a lot of state support already for families, that they're allowed to stay in the hotels way longer through the summer. There's way more vouchers for hotel vouchers for families than there are for individuals. Okay. It was sort of like, where is the need and how can we? Because yeah, we, we can't serve everyone. Oh, Sir, could you uh, come up and... Thank you. Yes, thank you. So my name is Justin Butterfield, and I'm not an abutting landowner, but the edge of my property is across the street from Clark Drive. And I would have found out about this in the newspaper on Thursday had I not gotten a phone call on Wednesday. And we don't have enough time for me as a Hyde Park resident and parent of three young daughters, right? And so all of my questions about drug usage and the sex offenders and all of that is not because I read it online. It's because I live there with three young children. And if everybody doesn't remember, 10 months ago, a homeless man murdered somebody in Morrisville. That happened here in our town. We didn't see it online. It happened here. Not only did it happen here, but it happened to a very good friend of mine's child, right? And so that happened in our town, in this population that is being put across the street from my home, where I live with three young daughters with no opportunity to have a discussion about it. It was passed by the zoning board without the select board knowing. That's crazy. 
Wait, wait, let, me, let, let me let me stop you. Let me stop you right there. Just to clarify, okay. Basically, what it was is it we did see it, but it was as an emergency shelter, and we in, did not envision that as a homeless shelter. Right, and right, that's what we Brian? that's what we saw. Yes, sir. So, Brian, in the article in the News and Citizen and the Still Reporter, your group had many discussions with the Johnson Select Board. That's a direct quotation from whoever is quoted in that article. Did they have any conversations with our Select Board? Not that I'm aware of. No, they didn't need to because they went to the to DRB, the airport, yeah. DRB, right? But in Johnson, they prioritized that for many months, trying to find a resolution. Well, they probably months. had more information than what we did uh, as to the uh, reasoning and what they were going to be doing, and we weren't we weren't made aware of that because, like I said, the wording in the in no. the proposal. Johnson, Johnson, doesn't have, Johnson doesn't have zoning, so that's why they had to go to the city. Oh, oh, there we yeah, go. We yeah. had we had um, right. We had. Um, an organization we were talking to about a piece of property in Johnson, and we were aware of Janice House being there too. I mean, I'm just telling you, there's a very long article in two yeah. different newspapers. Yeah, we had one meeting with Johnson. But the, has anybody read the articles in the newspapers? Yeah, yes, it, absolutely. It specifically says that you were meeting with the Johnson Select Board. And so, again, if our Select Board had the very most minimal information or did not know if some members didn't know at all and it was just passed by the zoning review board without any sorts of studies the other question i have is that the multiplication factor of five homeless people living in a shelter and 21 homeless people living in a shelter is not or it's how many people live at yellow house we have 12 beds and two overflow and so so there so how many people are there on a nightly basis it can range from 12 to 14. So every night there's that many people? On average, there's probably about And in the first 60 days of this year, there's already been 10, 10 calls to the sheriff's office, not including the calls about answering questions or giving rights, 10, 10 responses, and not factoring in a former police officer's personal experience with all of that. When you double that population, I mean, that the, the number will undoubtedly go up by a higher multiplication factor than two. And so I don't know how anybody can respond to that. I mean, no, to tell you, in general, 12 people get along much better than 21 or, or 21. You're and trying so to get facts on something that you're assuming. But I'm not, but we're using all of the facts to, mm. to plead their case. They're talking, they're giving us all of these numbers that are not actually applicable because the facilities are very different. The number of people involved is different. The, the numbers they're all giving us are, are feel-good numbers, but are not factual numbers that are going to represent what is happening here at Forest Hill. And so he referenced an 80-year-old person earlier. If you just happen to be listening to that, you hear that. We're talking about a number of incidents. It's not funny to me. It's really not I'm, as you're smiling at No, I'm not. Laughing. Again, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a directly... A, across the street from this with a young family and you I and mean, what is the sex offender screen we we definitely ask that and if people are sex offenders then they are required to register just in like what time frame within the three days that they're required to just like that and what if they say no then they they're not allowed to say what if they say no they when you say leave. when you say are you a sex offender because you just said well, you asked that. there's a there's a public record database and you can search anybody's what name do you search it I personally do on a regular basis just for my own protection. So regardless. part but part of the screening is not searching if they're a sex offender. You're asking them to tell you. And no, she just said that she does the search. I, I check every it. single person that is going to be checked into this facility is going to be checked in as a sex offender. And then then just allowed to. No, they're going to be checked to see if they are a sex offender. So, right, to be checked to see if they are a sex offender. If they are a sex offender, is there any special protocol different than another resident of the of the facility? They have to register just like their they have to follow their regulation that they have set forth to them by their probation officer, whatever they have to do. I mean, I I don't think we as an organization can set any specific guidelines that are different. I mean, you would know better. I mean, there's there's laws and rules that yeah, as far as sex offender, they have to register yeah. in a, in and a period of time. Days. And there, there is a website that you can go to as a public that you can search every county that has registered sex offenders. There's a photo. So all of what you're saying, and, I am aware of, and okay. I know, and I know that the slip through the crack factor is very, very high, especially amongst the homeless population. 
I know that fingerprints are 18 weeks back. I know a lot of these numbers. I did my research before I came here because this is highly traumatic. I'm also a taxpayer in this town. None of the folks moving into this facility are going to pay taxes in our town, right? Like, no, uh, just for it, will this be as a nonprofit pay tax? Yes. Yeah. It will. And it will be, there'll be no tax breaks whatsoever. Oh, no. They've already, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so this back to like peaceful, Saul's talking about peaceful country living, suggested lighting on the whole road, which for safety is great, right? But now I'm going to have. Same. I was thinking the same thing. I live down there. Too. Like, oh, street lights. <laughs> but I like, get it. And also in the, in the newspaper, in the newspaper article, it specifically quotes people from the organizations quoted, and I'm not sure which one of the two organizations here are quoted, as that this is not an ideal location for it because of the proximity to available services. And so this was just an opportunity for a building that, that did work, but nothing else was factored in. You just immediately got it done. And then the zoning review board pushed it through very quickly. And now we're here as residents who just learned about this this week, and it's been in the works for months. So how how long have you been looking for a property to relocate? Years. Yeah. So yeah. why not why not work out with MSI the big red building on Main Street? That is right next to the current facility and and by the police station. How come the current facility isn't being used year round? Year round. That's my question. It does, it's not big enough. Well then, but if we use that standard, so what, what happens when we want to bring in forty people? Because this place won't be big enough for that. I mean, where's the where do you draw the line? Is what's it, big it, enough? And I also have a question of like the for us as residents of this neighborhood, your plan to get people into permanent housing is great. Fully support that. Again, I'm not saying we don't need to help people who need help. It's a revolving cycle for us in the neighborhood. You put a person into permanent housing and fill their bed immediately with somebody else. So it's not like there's no end in sight for us. It is an endless revolving cycle of you help somebody and then immediately bring somebody in. And the success rate is what's the what's the success rate? Of like oh, again, we don't know, so we don't know, know the, the reading station rate. Right? Um, but no matter, no matter what, those beds continue to be filled. And this. Thank you, Justin. We're going to need to get uh, some more people. Oh, there's someone here too. Yeah, someone so, um, too. I'm John Sherwood. I'm from Butter as well, and I work at Copley Hospital in the ED. So I think what I'm hearing is people othering all these people. These people are here. I see them in People come with drug problems. Enough to help problems. We need to take care of other people. These are these people aren't coming from Boston or New York. These are people from a mother county. We get some people from um, Teen Challenge from other states. We don't know what to do with them. We get people here. What we do in the ED, we, we place them on the There's no place to place them. It seems like these are our neighbors. I don't know why you just can't think about helping other people. I don't, I don't know, sir. It's not here, but these people you just said they're coming from out of state, and like no, I, I said they're not to people not to see we're not seeing the entire town to to shoulder this burden of helping our friends and neighbors. We're asking about 25 to 30 residents who were not given any say or discussion in the matter. So the whole town doesn't have to deal with this. No, the direct no, excuse yes. me, upstairs. Yes. upstairs. Upstairs. No door on it. Sorry. We have. Yes. Yeah. They live there. They stay on property. Yeah. They live there. Sir. Yes. We have. We have renters who have children who live on our property. And yes, they do. From Forest Hill Residential Care, as you come and go, you yes. see your property. We are in the butter. We are less than one tenth of a mile from. But you are in the woods and forests. With no visibility of your I'm not. Hey, I'm, out. I'm, sure. Look, look, I'm out. I'm out. I'm out. This is an informal meeting. This board obviously isn't making any decisions tonight. It's great conversation, but there's no need for argument. This is I'm fully sorry. about the community, right? So lessen the argument and let's just make it informational. There'll be decisions. So I guess what, what I'm saying is I'm gonna butter. I I know they've looking for places for years for this for this kind of facility. They found one which was abutting our property. I'm not really psyched about it because it abuts my property, but I know we need it in Memorial County. And where else would it go? Someplace in the woods, abutting someone else's property. Thank you. 
Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm going to take a clarifying question. Yeah, because I, 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 I'm really hearing what you guys are saying, and I'm listening. I, I'm not tone deaf. I'm not trying to sugarcoat anything. I'm listening to what you're saying. My question is, can you tell us the kind of things that would help ease your minds and understanding? What could Memorial Community House do? Their practices or their intake or I'll, I'll answer it. Really I'll, in order to make I'll answer in order to help. I, I live close and I look around this room. There's a daughter, 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 there's a daughter. If one if one of our daughters comes up missing, what is LCH's plan? No, it's not. No, that, but, that can't that, be. But it, yeah, that's what I'm saying. How does it get that far? That's what I'm saying. How should... Again, I'm not saying what I saw on TV. A terribly violent thing happened in our community 10 months ago. So you need to tell me that you're not going to allow sex offenders in there and that the people have to be clean and sober. It can be a no, it can be a, a clean and sober shelter. But but when you're telling me people aren't allowed to do drugs in the facility, that tells me that they have to come like you know down to the end of the road where my property is to do that or to walk back and forth to do that. But it's not you're you're not telling them they can't do drugs, you're telling them you can't do drugs in the building is exactly what you're telling them. Yeah, so variety and substances are are the kind of primary concern in public. Okay. Just saying, Thanks, so it seems right. It seems to me instituting mm -hmm. sobriety and drug testing for folks that would be that, that would be feasibly like enforceable, right. and, you know, right. which would mean searching their property because when they have the drugs in their bags, um, and they're just well, and in, they in, can, in a they bag, can do that. They That's don't. In their contract. She, no, 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 they don't. As a contract, she didn't say that they search people's property. She said that she's asked people if they could search their property, but it's not a that's not what they do. Okay, so we're trying to listen and understand so that we can talk. Well, there's just some confusion. I just wanted to clear that up that they don't search people's property. But I also want to point out too that there was a homeless man who died homeless not that long ago either. So this kind of works both ways, and we're trying to do the best we can to serve people, to serve all of our communities. Without endangering the public. All right. That's what it comes yeah, down to. Let's, affected, let's cohabitate. And make sure that everyone else stays safe. Yeah. I think that's what it comes down to. I'm I'm not mm -hmm. ignorant enough to say that I don't see the need for this, but at the same time, we need to you make sure that safe. Yeah. We all do. come to when I have a problem. We all do. So next, we're going to go to Emily up here, and uh, Emily. Hi. Thank you so much. Um, full disclosure, Emily Rosenbaum. Um, I am the president of the Rural Community Transportation Board. I am not here in that capacity. I'm also the initiative director for the Working Communities Challenge of Lamoille, which is as a backbone partner in the United Way of Lamoille County. I am here in that professional capacity this evening. I'm also a parent of three teenagers, so I do understand concerns about people stumbling around and drinking and doing drugs. Um, that is a concern for all parents of teenagers. Um, first of all, I want to mention that there was a meeting more than two years ago that I facilitated within all of the different people who do various kinds of housing in our community. At that meeting, all of those people and all of those organizations together set as the top priority for housing in our community are year-round shelter. And at that meeting, Jim, who did not have to do this, by the way, stepped up to offer to help Lamoille Community House figure this out two years ago, more than two years ago. So the accusation that this is something that is being done precipitously and being thrown together is not true. This They have been working on this. I have been watching them. It is not work that I have personally participated in other than facilitating that first meeting, but they have been doing this for a very, very long time. They did not just grab a property. They have spent a lot of time vetting this situation. That's the first thing I wanted to mention. Thank you. The second thing I wanna mention um, is the fact that we've had five murders in Morrisville. So if one of those murders was perpetrated by somebody who wasn't home, housed, that means the other four, do we need to know whether what their housing status was? We also know that um, we are, that um, law enforcement officers are far more likely um, statistically to be having um, situations of domestic violence. Does that mean that we want to say we want to ban law enforcement officers? The fact of the matter is that everybody can commit crimes. Everybody can do harmful and hurtful things. That's Those are things that happen in our communities, and we know that. 
I think what's important to think about is when we talk about the economy of our county, we are in a situation where people cannot afford to be housed, where a lot of people cannot find the units that they need. And believe me, Jim is building as fast as he possibly can to resolve that. And we're doing a lot of other things to resolve that. But the fact of the matter is that a lot of the folks who are unhoused are unhoused because we are in a difficult housing situation. So I just wanna make that very, very clear that we have a very significant situation where housing, where we have people with vouchers who actually are working one or two jobs and cannot get into units. The final thing is so that it's very important for our economy that people have an opportunity to be someplace so that they can be working in our economy. Um, the final thing that I want to bring up is in terms of transportation. Well, two things actually in terms of transportation. One, I heard a mention of buses. So microtransit is actually not buses. Microtransit is not a fixed route and it's not buses. It's small vehicles. And there are public information sessions coming up on this if anybody wants to go to those. So there's small vehicles and it's going to be from eight to five, five days a week in an, a range. As long as you're within the zone, you can hail it. It's almost like an Uber, except it's free and it's a small vehicle. So don't worry about buses. And the second thing is um, our Working Communities Challenge is working on the e-bike situation. And it turns out that you actually can get e-bikes with snow tires and even studded snow tires, um, which is very cool. You can get things that you can wear to make yourself more safe and comfortable in the cold weather. So those are actually really viable transportation options. Finally, I just want to thank Jim one more time for stepping forward um, to work on this. Pro on this, this has been an incredibly difficult lift, lift for Lamoille Community House and Lamoille Housing Partnership, and Jim has really stepped forward to do that work. So, if you have any questions about some of these things with transportation or what we've seen on the work um, as we've done some of this collaborative work across all of our different organizations, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you so much. Thank you, Emily. Um, I saw Bev Potter. She wanted to say something. Bev, you might be muted. I think her message said she couldn't attend. Oh, I see she's still on. Okay, let's go to Aaron. You got any questions? Hey, yeah, sorry. <clears throat> um, Honestly, many of the things that I was going to bring up, I'm not sure that there's any point at this point. Um, I guess basically I wanted to understand if there was going to be some type of threshold of incidents put into place, um, because this will be it's not the same 30 people forever. You know, you can't compare it to anybody could move in next door or whatever. I mean, this is 30 people that are changing all the time. So at what point does something happen that's too much? Like it's too dangerous, you know, with one specific individual where it gets shut down. You know, I I would also feel much better if there was a strict policy of no drugs and alcohol use and the sex offender registry check was done by the personnel, not on the honor system. Um, and that we were notified as neighbors, I am, a property directly across the street. I have three young daughters and that I check the sex offender registry often because I want updates on what is in my area. And so I want it soon. I want it right away when someone moves in across the street. Um, the other question, oh crap, I think I lost it. You know, you had mentioned there's no children in this facility and I imagine that part of that has due to safety. Um, so the fact that now this will be across the street for my children is a huge concern. And I know there's a need for it. And I don't think anybody on this road isn't in support of that. This is a rural location that does have a ton of privacy. And it is going to open up a lot of issues that don't exist when it's in the village next to a police station. The same amount of activity isn't going to be happening right outside. It's just not comparable, in my opinion. And if this may not have been thrown together for the people working on it, but it was dumped on us very like last minute. And so that is the consideration, you know, that I wanted to bring up. Thank you, Aaron. Um, so one of the things on your note would probably be a line of communication, probably with the surrounding neighbors might be of something to help with it. If there is some sort of an issue, I know that there's uh, 
privacy issues probably too, but uh, maybe something like that might be. Is there anybody else online that would like to say anything? Okay, not hearing anything. Do we have anybody else? That, you've already spoke once, ma'am, come on up. I'll just stand here if that's okay. You can come up, ma'am. We've got to put Don't you on the... <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Hard for me to look at. When... Yep, you can look at me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've met you. I'll be happy. Okay. Hopefully not in my work. <laughs> uh, my name is Tanya Searles. I'm at 809 Center Road. Um, I can see the end of Clark Drive from the end of my driveway. Um, I'm also a psychologist with 25 years of experience, and I have a private practice in the village. So I am an expert on how hurt people hurt people. And um, in my experience, humans harm humans much more than anybody even knows. Um, and so I, I, with that, I am somewhat, I would say jaded um, because I, I really do understand the traumatized brain and how it operates in interpersonal situations. And so, Homelessness is a trauma. And the reason why someone is homeless is often because of trauma. And I treat trauma every day. I'm an expert in trauma. And so I have a tremendous amount of empathy and compassion for people whose lives have fallen apart, usually because of someone else's wrongdoing. Another human has hurt them. Um, if you want these people to be part of our community, you have done a terrible job at starting them off on the right foot. Um, the, the, the idea that, that, that these people are gonna be part of our, I, you, you might not know, but our children walk to each other's homes. That um, we, I don't lock my home. I leave my key, car keys in my car at night. Um, these are things I won't do anymore. Um, you know, I leave my children home without an adult. Uh, because it feels really, really safe. Neighbor, 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 neighbor. I walk my dog on my road. If I meet up with someone, I say, how you doing? How's it going? What's new? Um, I don't ever go, oh, oh, no, you know, I better get home. And and this feels very scary. And you can hear the emotion in my voice. Um, it, it, these folks are also very emotional. Um, I think the rollout has been played very poorly. And so you will have to earn trust back um, from us in order for us to um, agree to absorb a, 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 a group of strangers into our community. It's a neighborhood. It's not just <laughs> houses that are that happen to be next to each other. We've created a neighborhood. And it's important for us um, to feel safe. That is, and we want, you know, the 21 individuals who live in this space to feel safe as well. But it's, it feels like um, putting a group of very, very vulnerable adults at the end of a dirt road in the woods um, is not the right place for them when they don't have transportation. And I understand you're working on all of that and there's all these, um, you know, steps that you're taking to address those things. And I don't want to look at you like it's, you you know, like you're the person, but you're the person sitting next to me. Um, but I, you know, I feel like there are way more obstacles here for even those 21 people. Um, and that's not even considering the obstacles for those of us who are the neighbors um, to this, this facility. Um, and, you know, I don't know where we're at in the decision-making process. And I know there's, there are maybe some things that can happen at this point. And I appreciate that you're hearing our concerns. Um, I know that a low barrier uh, homeless shelter is, is going to draw a certain type of folk and that um, that's a big concern. So I don't know if you can change the barriers um, at this point, but that's, those are, those are some of the things. That the low barrier is the one that's in the village next to your office. Yeah. The one up at Forest Hills is not going to be low barrier, right? It's going to be, yeah, it's going to be the same. It's going to be the same thing. It's low barrier. Yeah. Which is, tell me again what that is. Thank you. It means no use of, no use of possession of 
alcohol so okay anything okay but that only means in the building so it doesn't mean any any sobriety definitely coming and going we we got that i got yeah. are they required to have a license do they have to have proof of identification that's something that we we work on with people if they don't have it we ask them if they don't have it then we help them get it get it when they come in if they don't have it because it's something that most housing um like um housing authorities when they apply for housing require that they have so if they don't have it we help them get it so what if um i have an incident with uh one of your guests and um i call the police and i say i had this incident and then the police go to your facility and say this woman had an incident and you say well i don't know who that person is because they didn't have an id well, we we do a complete boat intake and get all kinds of information from people when they come in. they're not just allowed to stay there there's like a whole screening intake process of all kinds of information we collect from people when they come in so so you would turn over that per, that individual's identity if i said there was an incident that was scary for me or one of my children um i don't know what do you mean by turnover identify uh, identify that guest it would depend on what the incident was i mean we we do not i mean we do have confidentiality rules that we have to follow like as, as you know you know like i mean there is a there is a line. I mean, if, if well, the police, police say they need it, will they if, get it or no? If the police come looking for somebody specifically, we we absolutely give them that. We we do not. I mean, we we have always very much complied with with what they need. Um, but if you were to come look for somebody, we wouldn't be able to tell you that. But we we always went to law enforcement. Absolutely. So they do work with law enforcement, but just to be clear. We don't know who's over there. Yeah, we don't call them and, and tell them every person that comes through the, through if, the door. Um, Sergeant Watson, if you asked, uh, there's a person gave a description, like a physical description, and he said, we believe they're living there. Do you have anybody there that matches that description? What is their ID? Have you ever had that situation where where you don't know who you're at? You're not calling for John Smith. You're asking for, we, we just had an incident in a fight out on the street. Do you have this person matching this description who's living here? And we need to know who they are. And have you ever had that situation? I personally have not had that okay. situation. I haven't had to deal with something like that. Okay, folks, we're going to have to wrap this up. I'm going to give it 10 more minutes. And come on up. You've had your hand raised. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Corey Chappell. I'm the board chair for the Lamont Community House. Okay. So I just want to say, one, I feel I've heard everyone's concerns. And so really thank you for raising them. Safety. I have a child. I get how much you want to protect your children and that it brings up a lot of anxiety and fear um and i think you're really helping inform the topics that we can bring up on the 10th at the community informational session and i invite you all to join us there i would also like to say i volunteered at the shelter starting in 2018 and again i'm hearing a lot of fear and we're stereotyping a lot of the people um people like we would go to the shelter and especially with past experiences because of your profession you have seen some really negative sides i have seen another side i've seen teenagers 18 19 working on resumes job applications school applications um seniors who have come because they can't afford the heat in their house and had no place off to go they're coming for a hot meal they're coming to get some compassion. I've hugged them and they're on the verge of crying because of their situation. And at the end of the shelter season in April, when they're closing, it gets tense. Literally tense because they are going out in the cold. They don't know what those plans are next. And so there's a lot of fear. So by having this year-round shelter 24-7 staff with the program, they're going to be a little bit more apt, I think, to engage in some of these programs um, and be more successful maybe than they have in the past. So just want to remember that. I do want to offer um, to come see the shelter, come meet the staff and the guests. We have a dinner volunteer program. You can sign up online. Go and see, go check it out. I just, it helps to eliminate maybe some of that concern and see who's there. So I just want to invite you to do that as well. Um, that's all I really wanted to say. I just want to make sure that we're bringing the emotion and the compassion back into this. 
these are our neighbors and we want to make sure we're not calling these people. They are our friends, our community, they're humans like us. Thank you. Where's Thank your, you. can you just kind of announce when the community forum is and where? Yeah, there's, there's flyers over oh, okay. Okay. March 10th. Yeah. So where? The library. At the library. Okay. Yeah, I don't want people to think the process is backwards. We, we looked at the site and had to find out if we could actually do it for zoning and have, have that change made before we could commit to everything. So we kind of waited for that to happen and we're kind of still in that waiting period. But in the meantime, the community house has been planning, you know, public information so that we could get in front of it and start talking to the community and work that out. No one is trying to put anything on anybody or doing anything under the radar. Um, we have to follow the procedures that are set up for us legally. And follow those steps, I guess, in order to, to get to where we need to go. Okay. And, and, and I would suggest to these forums that, you know, um, my personal feeling is what what can we do to work this out so that it's going to be a success for the community and for the folks that, that need housing so that we can keep helping people get out of the situations that they're in and move them forward in their lives so they can be successful as members of our community and, and live with us and pay taxes and have jobs and do the things that they need to do if they can. Thank you. What, what, Nicole, you said you said some of the people that go down there work. Mm -hmm. Okay. They work, they get a check. Do you guys take their money and save it for them so they can get on their own? Or how does that work? We I don't go, take their money, but we do... Um, so, for people to capstone to Mary Johnson, she's the budget and financial counselor over there, and um, they work with savings plans and and budget stuff and working on building credit and stuff like that. And that'll be something that would break somebody in. controls their. They don't. We don't. People don't have payees that control their money. We don't. You have to have a, That's a legal thing to have somebody do that, and we can't. You have to have go through the court, have somebody be a payee and control their money. So we don't have that. I, I guess I don't understand so, how they're going to get out on their own. That's so. So they do work with with um, a financial counselor and work with with all with that type of programming. But in order for somebody to be able to take your money and hold it for you, you legally have to be made a payee of their money, and that's a court process. And that just isn't in the court. It's, it doesn't mean they aren't saving their money. Yeah, it doesn't you mean that. We just can't, we, yeah, we just can't enforce it, but it's not, it's something, and that is something, so I used to work at Good Samaritan Haven and Mary. Three minutes. And they did have a, a program where guests were required to put a percentage of their paycheck in, but because we haven't been year round, we didn't have that programming, but it might be something that we could look into when we go year round. Well, that's, that's the thing, yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. the main thing here is the way you guys are talking is yeah. to get them. Yeah, a home for right now, and then get them out on their own. But if nobody's controlling that, yeah. So I do know destiny. That at Good Samaritan Haven, they did have that. People that worked had to put a percentage of their check into a savings. But because we've only been open six months, we haven't had that requirement. I mean, we got okay. We're gonna take one more. The last one. We got one person checking, online getting money. You know, making more money. We were good to hand up here on the. I don't know who it is. On Hello. Icon. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hi, my name is Erica Couture. I live at 204 Center Road, and I am case manager at Copley Hospital. And I would like to bring up a few points that have not been mentioned tonight. I've heard a lot about alcohol and drug abuse, but I can tell you um, we've had an increase in homeless people in the hospital, and every single one of them has a large mental health issue. So that's something that has not been discussed and I'd like to bring that to the forefront. And the second thing is that when we call 211 to try to house a homeless person when they're ready for discharge, they can be housed in Burlington, Rutland, Bennington. So how is that stopping anybody discharging from a hospital in any other county from being housed in Lamoille County? Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's going to be it, folks. We got another business. We got one other thing that was going on here. I need to read there. Okay, let you read that, and then that's it. Yeah. 
is from Bev Potter. Yep. So I am concerned whether this program will have adequate staffing to meet needs of residents and maintain safety for neighbors while every other program is cutting crucial services due to lack of employees. So what is that ratio, the uh, staff to uh, the 21 are going to be? So we will have two, two staff on at all times and we will have an on-call staff for their transportation. So there will never be one staff on at all times. The transportation will be dealt, will be handled by an on-call staff that will be, the transportation will always be dealt with with a certain staff. And there'll be two staff on for the 21 people. And currently in the Yellow Hub, we have one staff on. The people we have in the uh, off hours, yeah. And the zoning is restricts us to three staff members. Yeah. So if, Really? Yes. The current, the current so you're saying the way it's set up. You're willing to have more staff members? Uh, I don't see why not if we needed more staff members. We're trying to put them on. We can get but right now. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, folks. Um, I just it. want to say something because I do live on Center Road and I am right close by, probably one of the closest. And I did know you were coming to town. So I don't know why anybody else didn't know, but I knew. And I think I read it way before in the paper. I don't know. So it was out there. So I know everyone else didn't said they didn't, they might not have read the paper like I did, but I didn't know you were coming. To I think some people weren't categorized as interested parties either. That should have been like based on page seven of the report that was shared out. Uh, that's an incorrect list. So there are definitely some of us who did not receive notice and there's no reason that we shouldn't have. Thank you. Drew. Thank you everyone. Brian, how do we find out when the next meeting about this is going to be? It's a tent and you get a flyer over there. So it won't be on. So, no, so on. that's just going to be, be talking about a select board meeting. Select board meeting. Um, this, yeah, when we find out when it comes up next so we don't miss it. Well, well it'll be on the agenda and it's posted on, on the uh, website. Okay. So, yeah. Usually, well, uh, Friday before, we try to get it on before the, the Tuesday like meeting. Has been getting passed out, so we can sign up for an email about it. Well, we're we're also working on trying to use Facebook and other yeah. media. There's a website yeah. that everything's posted on all the time. It's on Hyde Park website, it's right. everything's posted there all the time. Every There's every much deeper than yeah. get them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Town of Hyde Park agendas and meetings, everything's there. Yeah. Will it be on Thank Zoom you. for those Thank of us both. who cannot be there? Do we think we're going to do something? Well, i going to wait for the same i you're gonna make it oh i'm working on that condition we're not going to put you in the middle of 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 the what are we going to start on this? The report on the after afternoon bus safety concerns. Hey guys, guys, hey, we got to keep moving. Thank okay. you, folks. Have a good evening. Safe trip. Okay. okay. If we're going to move forward, we're moving forward. Yeah. I would say give Judy Lancaster a call. So she can talk about, as she said, they were supposed to be talking about, are they supposed to? The mowing contract. The mowing contract. Oh, yes. So well, do you want to? We can do that another, we can reschedule it. Uh, yeah. Oh, they, they, they were there to the mowing contract? Uh, yeah. No, no, no. Just the concept of it. They do their own mowing contract. We do our own mowing contract. Recreation does their own. You want to consolidate it? Right. So okay. it was just a discussion. It wasn't a Okay. All right. Emergency meeting. So we can. You guys keep going and let me just go step in the hallway here and give Judy a call. Yeah. It's okay. We'll talk yeah. to her. Yeah. Ask her if she can do uh, your eighth meeting, March 8th. Yeah. Okay. 
So do we follow the agenda or do you want to try to help out anybody? Who are the the left, maybe. <laughs> yeah, whoever's. You're here for ma'am, or any certain? Um, oh, yeah, Atlanta. okay. <laughs> yes, we've talked on the phone. Savannah's here to enjoy the meeting. Yeah, I'll be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Inclusion already on the line. I was only interested in the uh, ARPA funding and what your uh, public works issues are that you can address. Okay. okay. Um, so let's hear from Linda. So okay. I wait for Susan. No. It's good to have a face <laughs> to the name. I've been, yeah. yeah, so. Thank you. And I read your report. Believe it or not, I went through all of it, and it was very good, very well presented. I don't know if everybody else read it or not, but uh, it, it was laid out pretty well. I, I did appreciate that. So, yeah. When did this one come out? I'm sorry. The, her report. Her, was yeah, that, that was with our. It should budget, have been in with the, the budget stuff. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah. This wasn't this week. I would have been last week. No, it was this week, was and this week. I just read it within days ago. Well, last week we got it. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I think Jennifer sent it out with it. You Thursday. Know, yeah, with, yeah. Yeah, with Jennifer's. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I was like, okay, yeah. Okay. Two different. It's like, I, I would have missed it. I'm reading so many stuff at this point that I'm like, yeah, did I miss something? So, I'll fill you in. Yeah, I, thank you. I'm very much better vocal than I am reading myself. I mean, I'm dyslexic. <laughs> Should I wait for Susan? Um, no, let's keep moving yeah, along. Yeah, and... yeah. Great. Okay, so um, with the this is the June 30th, 2020 audit, and we've just completed that. And there were 15 adjustments, and eight of those were related to capital assets, three to transfers, um, one to different revenue, and one for pensions. But the transfers were very important because it was for the library funds. Yeah. Um, there was some confusion. I think a couple of individuals were involved with doing the transfer journal entries. And so one was done annually and one was done monthly. And so it was doubled up and then some. So yeah. we had to adjust for that. Okay. Then um, Jennifer was delighted that there was a transfer that was missed for capital projects for your garages. So um, that was 45,000. And so that went into the capital project. Okay. Um, from 2019, the voters have restricted that for, for that. Perfect. And then another small transfer. But because there was eight capital asset adjusting journal entries, that became a finding because um, the capital assets were not accounted for properly. There was some problem with the tax or the um, software used for capital assets. And then um, there wasn't, um, usually there was a CPA that would come in before I would do the audit and she would make the adjustments for the capital assets. And that was overlooked. I think mm -hmm. that because of the transition to could have been. Um, Jennifer didn't have the knowledge, but she's eager to learn yeah. and she's really, she's already done the capital asset schedule oh, for 2021. Oh, great. So, so we're going to work together and I'm going to help her as far as with um, some of the nuances for the Nemeric system. Uh, the way that it posts, um, it allows you to post a date and then it will record it in the general ledger when it's not in the trial balance from the prior period. So we've got to unravel some of that and then we can move forward. But I'm going to help her with that and then um, with other schedules that she'll need to do um, for other CPAs. But I, I'm eager to help her and assist her with that. Great, thank you. Yes. thank you. I like working with her. She I'm is working with the town. It's, yeah. just, it's great. Yeah, I'll go yeah. on record and say that I'm impressed with her. As yes. Well. Yes. Not yes. just impression that the weeds here, but I'm impressed yeah. with her. Yeah. yeah, she's very good. Well, and yeah. she seems to have the enthusiasm. I would recommend, though, that she um, join the GFOA, and that's the Government Finance Officers Association, and they're for the United States and Canada. And they're specifically for governmental accounting. And you can go on the website and they have interesting um, 
nuances about the new standards that are being issued for government or articles um she can get well they used to have a magazine i don't know if it's all online now but um they, a lot of insight into budgeting and um, different accounting just for governmental because it's a different type of accounting. Yeah, she's been very enthusiastic about trying to learn more and stuff, yeah. and we really want to promote that as much as we can. So, yeah. Yeah, so and good. they do offer um, through Vermont. They have a Vermont GFOA, so she could attend and have mentors with other Excellent. Um, individuals. Oh, Excellent. So I, good. So I, I would suggest that, that she... The GFOA. <laughs> and then, um, then there's um, trips to Washington or Portland or these other places too. <laughs> Chicago. There you go. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. It, it would be a nice experience for her and encourage her to learn more. Exactly. Exactly. That's what we need. <laughs> so, there was one other recommendation I had. Um, it was the cemetery is not on the financial statements for the town and the cemetery activity should be on um, yeah. because the funding, for yeah. generally accepted accounting principles, they're considered a component unit. And so um, it, it's been difficult to get their information and then record that information and make it part of the financial statements. But because it's not material, I don't believe um, it's not a finding. Yeah, but, but it is a recommendation. Sure, sure. I think it's something we should adopt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've had a, a two or three year back and forth process between the historical practice of sending the commissioners the twenty two thousand dollars a year which has been going on forever and, and taking advantage of their volunteer services to make all the cemetery yeah. maintenance happen. Right. But we're sort of arm's length on the contracts and internal controls and knowing that we can spot them on the town property. So a couple of years ago, three years ago now, we finally got them to a meeting basically and try to get these contracts and over top insurance issues resolved that we're not being paid attention to it, that kind of thing. Right. The next step is to basically treat them like the highway department where the voters have twenty-two dollars or $25,000 for cemetery, and they can still hire the people, but they would, the invoice would go to the town of Hyde Park, yeah. and we'd run it through Jennifer's system, oh, gotcha. which isn't being done now. Okay. So that's a matter of them uh, having a meeting or two probably with Jennifer, maybe having access to Glenn for a question, and then sort of turning over their uh, checkbook, if you want to call it like that, so that they're not doing that off, off work. Yeah. Do it. Okay. I mean, so that's a, that's an ongoing conversation. I think part of it is really just the historical. We've done it this way, and everybody's sort of okay with it. Right. So it's more of a learning curve. Okay. So we're all, I think we're almost there. Uh, Judy Lampert did ask for a meeting. Okay. Uh, sort of mid COVID, and it just didn't work right. between the finance director changes and all that stuff. Yeah. 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 It's on the eighth. We can mention okay. that. We can mention that when she comes in. Exactly. The yeah. I don't want you to um, say you're going to take the checkbook away because you could let them have the checkbook, but then Jennifer could have access to record the transactions and then that it's on the books. Yeah. yeah, I only mentioned that because they may be relieved. Sure, exactly. <laughs> 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 it's interesting enough to say, and I need to know more about that because it might be the time for us to do that. There you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. COVID, here, so to speak. Yeah. So it might be time to redo that. Yeah. So, um, with 2021, we've already started, and we're hoping to have that complete or I plan to have that complete by mid-May. So mm -hmm. with Great. that season, we'll, we'll continue to go forward. Yeah. But um, fortunately, I can't dedicate myself just to the financials right now. Okay. Okay. But I appreciate the time that you've given me to complete the audits. And yeah. then I, um, I'm in good health now and right. I'm doing really well with local um, treatments with community health services and Copley and UVM. So Great. I can Great. highly Excellent. recommend them. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Thank, you yeah. thank you for the extra time. Okay. Thank, you. Thank, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you for your work. So what do we want to do next?
Oh, it's your choice. You, can go you might as well go down the list. Back now, to the right? top where we see. Okay. So we get the bus, uh, bus uh, stories. Uh, report. Yeah. Let's do the bus. Let's do the bus safety yeah. concern. And let's let board down in 214. So last meeting, Kevin um, and Allie Judkins were here to, to raise a concern they had for the afternoon bus service. I think they were good with the morning bus service. They seem to be okay with general road conditions, but they were concerned about asking. I think they, they either heard something, saw something, or whatever, and they wanted to raise that issue with the town select board directly at the last meeting. And I think Roland uh, said they check into it, or somebody said they check into it, and now it's time to come back to the board mm -hmm. or with whatever. What are finding? What are they reporting? Yeah, I talked to um, the superintendent, and um, she said there was no issues up there in so Garfield with the road. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sell cat. What's cat? Cat. Gallagher. Yeah, Gallagher. And 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 then she contacted um, Preby, Josie, yeah. and Josie went on to overdrive the bus. And then I made a phone call to Josie, and Josie told me that there was no complaints about the roads up there. They were fine. And um, I don't know what more to say. I, I called Kevin. I told Kevin exactly what they told me. And there's three, she said, Kat said, there was three principals that live up there. But I guess there's yeah. three women that live up there that come down through them roads in the morning and go back in the afternoon because they live up there. They're, and, they are principals. And I didn't talk to them, but they said the roads were fine too. So I did take I talked to them. They said they were good. Yep. So oh, good. Okay. That that's um we'll just go on. Okay. Good. Thank you for and I made the call yeah. to Kevin and okay. But I, I talked with another resident. They said that basically it followed the same thing that the weather hasn't been exactly frivolous to making the conditions great, you know, the morning they drop in sand and it just falling through. So right. I think it's I mean, it's going good. There's warmest January we had since they've been keeping records. So. Limit on global warming. <laughs> okay. Uh let's see. Uh, capital projects, uh, grant report and ARPA funds and publish ARPA public notice to invite suggestions. Yeah, so uh very interesting time to be in the office and watching the state and federal governments trip over themselves to try to find projects. The Congress basically appropriated way too much money and had high expectations that all these little municipalities across the United States would have all these pending projects ready to go. And, and they gave everybody three, you know, the three full years plus two more. So three years ending December 24th. State of Vermont is having a road show, we call it, on <laughs> the 20th of March, which chastity- 30th said, of March? 20th. Well, I thought it was 30th. Well, it's on notice for 20th. Oh, okay. I better go. So just check that. Yeah, no, because that was in, you just emailed today. I saw you said chastity know. will be at- I know. So anyway, that, that may have been there. So we're back. And thank you. Yes, it was so, this, the, the road show, if you want to call it, is all the commissioners from every state agency going to every county, including Hyde Park on the 20th of March, to plead for projects because they have too much money. And part of it is because it takes time. Some of the projects that we have now that we're going to talk about in a minute, they take two or three years to get to that point. Before you can even advertise a you know, construction project, you know, a playground project, where there's an absolute need and a really off the shelf kind of deal is is e easy, you know. But that doesn't get you to the seven hundred thousand dollar high park number. Well, um, we're about a hundred thousand. Big playground, Matt. Yeah, that's what you want to do. A big playground. It's a heck of a playground. So the, yeah, the last meeting we, we had to fight for what I got. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't recommend it. I don't think the fight was too hard. <laughs> the last board member that left here. <laughs> Um, yeah, we won't say nothing. We're right. good. <laughs> so the last meeting, we, we had a brief, brief conversation about this, and that this is the time to get these projects together now, because you really don't have a lot of time to sign a contract with a, with a contractor by December 24th, if you wait all of the 23, thinking about it. Right. And you're already going into the you know, March meeting, and 
it's going to be April, and pretty soon the time's going to be spent. What happens if you don't obligate six hundred and three thousand dollars by December twenty twenty four? The money goes back to the U.S. Treasury, which some people philosophically don't have a problem with because that money is borrowed from China or it was, you know, going to be debt for some. Well, people. can't we do like an emergency tax relief kind of thing? Like we could relieve our town people of taxes if we don't spend some money. I don't think that's a do. No, I don't think that counts, does it? Yeah, there was, there was, there, there was some literature in there, Arpa, for that. There yeah, is? There, yes, there is. There's some strings. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Uh, but before we give it back, we're going to do something with it. That's my argument. Absolutely. I'm, not, I'm sitting across this table saying money ain't going back. Our time is to get it out of it. Brian Shackett said he'd go home oh, after the last meeting and come up with all the ideas that never happened during his term because he's come up to the end of his term. So that was one of the purposes of tonight. What does the board want to add to the two lists? I'll go over the two lists that we brought by. But then, then how, how do you want to do more of it? So that's that's where we are today. Now, the two project lists that we run, there's two. They're both posted on the website. The ARPA list, which is the sort of the wish list that we started two years ago now, that has been partially completed. It's posted on the homepage for everybody to see and edit, or we cross something off if we put the project. The other list is the grants and projects list, which is um, everything that's grant funded that's in process now, and there's 17 projects on this list. There's about the same number of projects on the ARPA list. So all of those are kind of rolling along, if you will. And most of those are funded in the sense that they're either funded by reserves that we have, or there's a, uh, a grant a match that we're going to leverage with another grant. So that the funding on the grants is relatively under control. Which means that you don't need to access your ARPA money to, for match. Now the state roadshow that's coming in is saying we will we will match your if you want to use some local money and save some other local money for other projects. We've got enough money. If you have a project, we'll, we'll go 50 50 on it. That's the kind of thing that they were trying to. And that that covered everything from broadband to highways to healthcare to housing, oh, wow. anything that you could think of. And we have a we have a list. So do you want to accelerate that list? Is one question. Do you want to add to that list? And it's really it's an unusual time. I don't know how, oh, yeah. how much more clear it can be mm -hmm. to have the state of Vermont, federal government, and even your own select board have money to try to figure out how to spend in a short, in a relatively short time. So when she goes to that meeting, we should gain more information on what, yep. what that is. Yeah, they were giving examples of projects and trying mm -hmm. to figure out like what, and they basically, we need towns to have projects. That's that, that's what they're trying to tell people. What projects do you have? So we're working more. Oh, he's raising Paul, his hand. Oh, come on, come on up, Paul, up here. He's like, I got an idea. Boy, well, I got <laughs> this is my can right now. I'm coming in. <laughs> Welcome, Paul. Thank you. So, so we've been thinking at Sterling View of uh, taking our clubhouse and turning it into a, an emergency shelter that would be accessible to anybody that needed the emergency shelter. So we got a power outage, a lightning strike, a fire, or this or that, whatever it might be. Can, can I can I ask? Can I go outside the box? I.e. homeless. I just said that your house fire. You had a house fire. Oh, okay, okay. So this is somebody. Red Cross related. I think. Yeah. Okay. okay. There, there's age constraints too in the park. So with that. Well, we we do. We also do background checks on. Okay. <laughs> so one of the things of concern is that that um my park's really good with their power and we have very few outages and they don't last very long okay that's true yeah and however the reality being what it is one of the worst events we ever had was an out of town the big ice storm yep. comes to mind i lived in morso and it was out for four or five days there at one time it wasn't the ice it was something else because of the we were supplying power from our generation plants in morso and I and I so I said to Dean Wakefield, the he said, "Well, where was the power going?" Well, he says, "We're under obligation to sell it, so we're making power, delivering it on the grid to somebody else, right?" But what was coming back was <laughs> was it coming through our power grid stations, right, yeah. to supply us, even in the village? It's unbelievable. We own the power company. 
I saw I was done. Uh, I was this, is, this is ridiculous. The point is here is that we need a generator, right? Mm -hmm. Put it in a building type thing with air vented and all that stuff. Right? So you need a structure. Because originally what we were after was to have portable things so we could go from home to home. We'd wire you up to those places that needed it. So there's, there's a few people up there that, that need power for their uh, air oxygen. Oh, um, right. And they were nuts when the power goes. Of course. It didn't I would do it. Can we? Yeah. Actually decided that if life was worth living in such an area as that because the power went out a couple times up there and he, he got his daughter to run out quick and get his car and pull it over to the window to his bedroom. You know, really? Oh, uh, his battery. Geez. So anyway, he, he did the assisted suicide there. I'm yeah. serious. I'm wow. serious. And so he finally decided he couldn't live that way. Yeah. He was struggling for air every time it happened. He'd, he'd get, and then his heart would terrible. Yeah. <laughs> he'd get, yeah. It was awful. Yeah. In any event, so I thought it would be a good place to have one. We've got 113 homes up there. Yeah. Famous living in, <laughs> in Jackson. Mm -hmm. Here's a good way to, to use some of this art for money. To, to build a, a building, a small little structure here and there, yeah. to house a generator that's full fledged to, to that building, yeah, exactly. wire it up accordingly. The only issue is that if you get into the public building atmosphere where you're going to have a shelter, <laughs> sometimes they require certain specifics of its con construction, you know, fire code sheet lock, the usual routine. And if you've got Meeting facility, kitchens, and that sort of thing, right? Where they require some other stuff. Showers. Then, Cost. Showers, right? I don't have showers yet. We got room for them. But um, we'd have to have those supplies. That's correct. And then the other is a sprinkler system. Now, I don't know how big the structure has to be to require that, the square footage. We don't even have. Uh, an assessment from the building inspector in the state of North Carolina Marshall's office as to how many people can be out, uh, put into that building just to sit down and have dinner. <laughs> There's a limit technically under certain public buildings like right in here. Right. I mean, you face that situation already. Mm -hmm. So, uh, like when we have our annual meetings, for example, we go, we go down the road to the VFW and require them to use their facility in order to make reservations for one in May. Because we don't, we know we don't have enough room to, to support it. And, and I'm sure that we would go way beyond fire marshals. So anyway, I digress. The point is that there's a project that perhaps could work, that we could get some background on it and some figures for the actual cost before the deadline, let's say is December. I mean, way before that, I'm confident. Let's right. let's yeah, let's drive right. ahead with that yeah. because because like you said, 113 uh, families or residents. Well, that's there. what's right there. Yeah, like, yeah I know. Melody Lane and Johnson premises. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And uh, so we're open to that sort of thing. Uh, we've been kind of working with the community for years. Ken Harvey started that. Yeah. When when he was given the funds and he blessed that and he gave back to the community in that manner. Come and use it. Uh, just involve my my residencies that are there already in the process, and you're you're in. Yeah. So you can't just you know rent the place out, but if the residents are involved in the process, then so we've had a continuance there and add more to it. Okay. If you're interested in square dancing, for example, we've got a square dance group that comes in there. Yeah. Just as an example, I have the question. Oh. Valerie. I did, didn't want to scare you guys this time. <laughs> <laughs> That's rolling. Um, yeah, so just really quickly, um, and thank you all for the meeting earlier. Um, it was very enlightening to listen to. Um, but on this, the ARPA funds, we had our guy on Valley Hall uh, committee meeting yesterday, and um, we are curious on the progress or the, the position that you're all in for the um, the heating system for the, the hall. And it sounds like from the conversation earlier that um, one can assume that, that the $60,000 will move forward. Uh, part of the conditions of ARPA that the town could apply, which we try to do, is leverage and simply accessing the ARPA money when there's equal or 100% money coming from the state right now 
is what needs to be explored there. So I know you have a $60,000 quote for a boiler. The state of Vermont just announced a <laughs> grant program to pay for 100% for energy upgrades at municipal buildings. That's something the Town Energy Committee is looking at now. So that's a kind of, I guess you'd call it a delay, but you would you would say we have a need and then the select board's position has been, how do we pay for it? And there's, like I said earlier, a few minutes ago, there's enough money <coughs> at the state level that we need to explore those as well, not just taking 60,000 local and you know, completing one project. And uh, I understand. Um, and I, I had sent you and um, Ron, you and um, Justin, a letter of support, a draft letter of support. I know it's not on your agenda. It was last minute, um, but just <coughs> reminding you of the deadline for the- You, you, log, you logged in about 10 seconds late at the beginning of the meeting. What's that? We did it. Oh, you did? Oh, oh. Yeah. I you, you were getting through the waiting room as they were signing it. Wow. The paper, <laughs> the paper is right there with my signature on it, Val. Awesome. Thank you so much. Appreciate You're it. Welcome. However, I mean, while she's on here, she might as well. I, I love this idea of having a generator for a, a, a place that's maybe the Dion Valley Hall becomes a, a place of uh, security. Um, for we got two places in, for emergency oh, we management. Got okay. We got two places, but. I was going to wait until after March to bring this up, but now might be a good time. They're coming up to the point where if you're going to use these places for shelters, for emergencies, you've got to have showers, you've got to have costs, um, and you've got to have stuff like that. So maybe the we got generators in the two fire departments, but we don't have the rest of it. So that's something I was going to wait until after the first year or so. So how do I find the list of what the requirements are? You said cots and showers. Yeah. As, as well, I know I just helped put in a shower and everything over at the Morsel Fire Department. They're going to use that for a shelter okay. over there. So that was one of the things that they had to do to uh, bring yeah, that into the Red Cross does an audit. Right. Yeah. Okay. And they'll define what I can do. What, yeah. What yeah. Are. I right see that right online. I yeah, yeah. There's a list. Right. Right. Yeah, Perfect. they'll actually visit. I think they will visit to give you like. I'm sure the broad brush. Sure. Yeah, we got two places. We just got to put some work into them. Yeah. And one of the things are you got to have cops and showers. Yep. Yeah. And we got the generators already. Think of anything else you need up there. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> but I was advised that anything that's a machinery mobile, for example, like having we were going to rig up a, a a mobile generator, put it on a trailer, hook hook on the truck, and I could take it to your house where you need, you know, we'd wire yeah, it, yeah, so yeah, yeah. get ready for it in advance, and it would just plug you in, and you're done with you, and we go across the street to your neighbor who's uh, he's jumping, and we plug him in. And we can get his unit all filled up and ready to go. And then, and that lasted so long. And we can take the unit across the back again in your place. You can keep the store in the You've got the right idea to put a, sh put a yeah. shelter into that, you know, yeah. I mean, for that power thing. for people to stay. I mean, you ain't right. got to house them for right. two or three days, maybe. Exactly. You know, you could help them for two or three hours. Oh, right, when the power goes out. Or, yeah, we can take that. Blood, blood check on you or breathalyzer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, even in reality, if you're just taking care of the folks are the there. Right. Well, you that's know, right. Be, you know, somebody that's else. Right. right. It could be other. Yeah, yeah there could, could be, be anywhere. You know, right. You know, right. temporary thing. I mean, it's right. right. If it goes out and all those places get right. hit, you suddenly got a lot of people, as you say, that are going to yeah. need some assistance. So. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Paul. See you next week. Savannah, got anything? She's going to go to the meeting with me on the 20th. <laughs> Mark your calendar. Right. Okay, so the Moore Valley Rail Trail <laughs> signage That's a good sign. on local roads. And yeah, I saw that map. Oh, one, one last thing. Uh, this is just a uh, somewhat related to the 
Crisis Care Home. We took out one notice two years ago in the paper saying that you all had this money and you wanted to make sure the community knew that you had the money. Wow. And the question on the agenda was, do you want to put another little block ad? It's like select board looking for public comments. We have, some, you know, give the rundown with this basically saying 603,000 is on. You know, assigned, right? I, I don't think we need to advertise him on money, but I think that we, I, and this is something I'm going to bring up later on. The way communication works, obviously, I understand Chad, you're a good reader. I'm not a good reader. You and I differ, we're on the board. I didn't know about the situation. So, but again, the more communication and the more we can put out there, the better off it is for our community. That's our job. That's what we should be doing, right? So, yeah. I, I think throw it out there. What the hell? Why not? Yeah. Yeah. It's just a, one day, yeah. Yeah. news and citizen yeah. follow up. We also advertise on the webpage too, right? Yeah. On the it's front page. It, 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 it did. Exactly. I know it's, it, it's it in that. You could say more. You could say, we want your idea. <laughs> 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 yeah. But it is in big letters. We can work. The idea is there when you first click on the page. And yeah. having to mention at your meetings is helpful because people hear it or see it and, you know, just keeping it on top. At some point, you're going to have to make some decisions and you don't want somebody to have a really great idea yeah. what it's. Yeah. You know, two days to I'm going to I'm gonna have Erica yeah. attend the next meeting. She'll speak much more. Yeah. Than me. yeah. So I don't, I'll do, I'll take care of that. And we'll just keep, try to keep it on top. As you're talking to people too, just like with Paul, it was by chance. He saw it on the agenda. He had an idea. He mm -hmm. came back. Right. So it's yeah. relatively easy to do, but if you're not for people like that, if you're not actually talking to them, right. they're not going to catch that little block in the right. newspaper. Right. So that was my last thing. Sorry. So yeah, so we'll, sure we'll, we'll move on to the Little Valley Rail Trail and the signage. And there was uh yeah, in the packet there was where they talked about yeah. putting the signage. Yeah, it's back in the packet. Yeah. Um, it's uh Four years ago, five years ago, now the village received a grant to put blue signs mm -hmm. at four or five different locations in the village. And those are what they call pedestrian signage. Those are small scale off the right away usually and designed for pedestrians, let's say. The state of Vermont, as they take ownership of the rail trail, is redoing all the signs along the corridor in northern Vermont where there was nearby rail trail access. So they're going to have like state park signs on the mm -hmm. with arrows to Hyde Park for our trailhead, but they're not able to continue that signage after you take the Church Street turn off the road without the town step over. So those are town highways which you the around the road. Oh. So these are, they call directional signs. Right. They're standard signs all over the state for the rail trail. They're proposing three in Hyde Park that need town approval. And there'll be one at the library to take a left, one down by two sons to take a right, and then one down by Depot Street Extension to take a right. To take a right down there. Right? All, each one of them has their own little um, issues. Not huge issues, but like the one in front of two sides, there's no room, there's no group, there's no median at two sides, mm -hmm. it's curved and sidewalk. Oh. So do you take up 24 inches of sidewalk and leave three feet to go around, or do you figure? Yeah, out that's ADA. That? You can't do that. So is it gonna? You gotta maintain a minimum of 48. So if the board's interested in seeing the next step, which is is there any light towers there? Are any? There, are there any street? There's no street lights. There, I don't know how I don't know what the options are. The street lighting is, is bad. I mean the, the village only put it in the high high oh, it's, not, it's not for pedestrians. I love them. It's not it's not anything, but they could do better with lighting. If but the issue is the there's conflicts with these three signs all right. over there. As to where they go, location -wise. Yeah, just like almost engineering type of issue. I love them. If the board doesn't object the signs of their lights, lights. No. there they go. I know. Yeah, there they go. <laughs> yeah. Zachary, probably, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> but if the board doesn't object to the three signs, then it will be a, the, I would tell the trans that and that we'll get engineering specs on how they're actually going to install them so they don't conflict with anything else. And I also want them to agree that once they provide them, that the town would own so we can move them if we wanted to. I'm thinking of a, the reconstruction of Church and Maine. Oh, right. We want to be able, I don't want any strings attached to those signs. Any more than VTrans wants to do maintenance, so yeah. I think, I think we're, we would get control, but they're going to give up on maintenance. Yeah, probably didn't put no money in their budget for it. Yeah, <laughs> they they're going to pay for the design and install. He's talking about the yeah. 
<laughs> no, I, I think they're. I You're bringing they, up the moment again. <laughs> no, to Roland, to Roland's point, I heard the whole thing. They used to totally ignore maintenance of their infrastructure. Now they now they don't. But what they did is they don't maintain. They tell you, you okay, <laughs> want us to build this, you're going to maintain it. Right. So they just changed their. They got the money. Right. Yeah. right. Right. The way they communicated. Yeah. So what do we need to do? We need to vote on this. No, not yet. No. Okay. No. It's really just a. Do you want me to continue trying? To yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Get a grant. Go for it. There we go. They need to know we can carry on. Okay, and then we did the audit presentation. Yeah, yeah. so that's done. You had that as an action item. And then uh, accept grants. Yeah. Oh, Raymond, you got an action item in there. So you had that as action item, the signage. Yeah, yeah. so it's a it's a requirement that the auditor mm -hmm. present the report, which she did. Yeah, she'll be back again in May if she can meet that time frame for the twenty one audit, and the board can vote to accept the audit. Not to approve. No, you know, that's you know, not the second guessing. Hold on, hold on, Ron. I'm going back to the the sign. You had the sign as an action item. Oh, sorry, sorry. yeah, the new sign. Right, as an action item. Was it also? Yeah, that's next. That's an action item. Yeah, right. So after that action item, the sign. I want them to give us the engineering plans. Okay. Okay. So do we need to vote on anything for you? No, not okay. after the sign. Okay. We're gonna get another chance at one. Okay. Okay. They give us the next level. Okay. And the CPA. Probably should have a motion to confirm that she presented and that you accepted it. Not that you approved it, it's just you accepted the 2020 audit. So moved. Second. Because I'm I understood her. Second. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Tell me. Uh, lingo. I got it. I got it. <laughs> I did. Okay. Any discussion on it? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Dating? There. Good. Thank you. No, I'm I am not looking at it right now. I'm uh, yeah. focused. I'm not missing anything anymore. Promise? <laughs> no. <laughs> Somehow I knew it. Yes. So, okay. Except the yeah, the scoping for the thirty thousand, the grant for thirty thousand four hundred dollars. That's all. That's the action item. The board approved the application going in to study the triangle. We call it the mm -hmm. scoping of amenities at the rail trail. Head trailhead at the 75 Depot Street extension. Um, State of Vermont has some interest in there because they are the landowner of the WC. Uh, we have interest in the town highway, which is Depot Street, with their new crossing up there, which is perennial complaints about that, especially during the middle of summer. Uh, mostly visibility issues and speed on Depot Street. So we're trying to look at that whole intersection for traffic calming as you leave the school and head to Morrisville. We're also looking at uh, ADA compliance from the intersection to the trailhead, which is a lot of compliance now. Yeah, I do. So that would be the extent of the scoping project. And if you accept the grant, um, I think it's a 24 month grant. <clears throat> we need a motion to accept, accept that grant. <laughs> So moved. <laughs> I was reading it. I know what I'm voting on, by the way. <laughs> I'm going to miss you. You are. Yeah. <laughs> You're okay. Back to me. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Uh, uh, aye. Can you be opposed to abstaining? <laughs> that would be Matt. He didn't move his lips. I know. He's reading. Yeah, I know. He's <laughs> trying to keep I, I'm sorry. Yeah, if you're right. Okay. Um, so town warrants, we all looked at them and we signed them, did we? I have not seen right. them. Okay, you haven't seen them, okay. Mask on. Yeah. So while you're looking at them, we're going to move on to the uh, approving the minutes for 214-23. I will make a motion to oh. Oh. All right, thank you. you making a change? No. Oh. Um, are you abstaining or are you approving? I I, I, I. You yeah. do? Okay. Yeah. okay, go ahead, sorry. Yeah. You didn't hear Roland or me, just for the record. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing they're scoping out each other. They're know. making sure they. I, I was yeah. just reading the local match part, making sure it comes from the sidewalk fund because I remember that was a past discussion, but I didn't hear you guys talk about it again as chair and co chair. You didn't bring that up, but that's okay. <laughs> I read it myself. Yeah, pass the book. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, the minutes. Everybody had a chance to look at the minutes? I did. I'll, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of 214. Okay, any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Anybody opposed or abstaining? Okay. 
Susan seconded. Did you yeah. 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 Susan seconded. Okay. Uh, so we still got to do the warrant, but they're still signing, so that's good. Possible executive session personnel. Um, do we want to do Cindy Riddle? Yeah, let's go on to Cindy Riddle. Now, you get the, you sent her the yeah. response, and he handed them out here, right here. This is the one he handed out to everybody here, and, and these are the responses to her questions that she had for us. Okay. And she's you've given these to her yeah, she, been emailed. she has them. the uh, most of her comments were related to the public hearing to scale. This was presented at the public hearing. Oh, the, okay. DRB. the DRE permit was in 2022 65 answered mostly. So I'll just remind Which you that said that some of those things got answered by 65. Okay. Other ones that weren't quite answered. I just I just cut and paste her comments and tried to answer. There's nothing more we can do. Exactly. Okay. Where does it stand right now? I have made a permit final as of this weekend. Okay. Nobody appealed. Oh, this was it right here. And you would know this is different. Have you read this? Yeah, this is what we're going to propose. Okay. No. I did read this. This was about the utility bill. Yeah. Yeah, I did read this. Yeah, that could have been $15,000 a year. So. Yes. So she, so his permit was approved. No one appealed. Really? Okay. So done. it's done. But he was talking about moving to. Well, oh, it's for sale, yeah. right? Yeah, I guess so. He, yeah. he can do whatever he wants with the permit. The permit exactly. had a couple of conditions of getting some things cleaned up and DRB found, like needing an addition permit, needing a remove the greenhouse or get a permit. Those are those are on their own schedule. Like, so was he the one with the five thousand dollar? Uh, yeah, and then yeah, he lowered yeah. to twenty five hundred. Yeah, or they can it off. Like, Correct. Yeah. Right. Strange. 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 The suit was from the sign check, it was from the county. And so, this is what's been there. Should we put that, that out there to see if that's happening? I think so. I think that's not a good idea. Transparency to non. Yeah. We want to, before we get through the, the, um, the letter about how much the fire department is going to be paying yeah. for the water and sewer. Which I just pulled the letter out, but I think yeah. that's yeah. something we should discuss. So it's on the minutes. Yeah. yeah. So, so everybody knows that here's what we're being asked to pay. What we're being asked. That's what we're being billed. Yeah. Would that be under other business or under the warrant? I think we go under other business. That's where that should go. Maybe some of the air from money should be used for drilled wells. Seriously. I think it's a good cut reason. Yeah, it is a good reason. Yeah. For sustainability. Yeah. Right. Is it? I haven't seen it I'll yet. I'll put that so. out there for the future. Is that what you want? For yeah. When you're gone? Yeah. <laughs> Send you a wish list. Right. We're still in other business, right? Are we there right now? We're on other business, yeah. Uh, yeah. So obviously there's town people here, and I just want to throw it out there. First of all, around like I, I you are a man of many freaking hats. So I, I'm not throwing this at you, but the communication, and I totally get it. Like, so for me to go in to find what was happening at that place, I had to go back and read the meeting minutes of the DRB. How do we as a town? And our DRB, I mean, the DRB already slapped us in the face a couple of weeks ago with us reversing one of their decisions. How do we and the DRB communicate to where we're making our general public more informed? We've talked to a motor housing partnership, actually, about improving communications. So there's two different, there's two different worlds. There's right. statutory and then there's other. The other is what do you want to do more than what you do now, which is minimum. We have a website, right? Post to desk. It's not uh, in your face kind of stuff. It's not, right? So, how do you look at the 
3,000 people in Hyde Park and say, what reaches most of these people the best way and what do we want to share with them? Social media. Correct. All sorts of different ways. Right. I mean, it's almost, a, depending on your extent of it, it could be a part-time job, really. Right. Because once you start doing those things, it right. becomes necessary to continue. You can't, for example, the best example I can think of is, let's say the DRB says, oh yeah, we need to do better. We need to get everything that we do on the DRB Facebook page as soon as I see an application, you know, pending application, applications going to hearing, decisions and appeal period. State of Vermont did this probably about seven, eight years ago. Every state permit application, or it's a wetland permit, if it's a wastewater permit, if it's an Act 250 permit, whatever it is, they make their records accessible mm -hmm. on the website. You still have to go dig for it. It's not easy, but it's accessible. It's not in the paper files in some back office, which is almost like what we do. We don't put it, we don't put those applications on. Justin is working on the third step of this like you guys have you know up to five thousand dollars, which is to get an online permit system available, which which would have that capacity. So we would be able to have well, all the records available during the per process, mm -hmm. during the hearing and after the hearing and then searchable later. We're not there yet. So that, that's a project. The other way around it, which is the example I want to give you, is a DRB Facebook page. Somebody says, great, I'm on Facebook all the time. I want to be able to friend them and get notifications and be just totally aware of everything. Well, what is everything? Right. Right. Public. Is it the public notice or is it just the decision? Is it uh, application submitted? You know, right. Where well, do you draw the line? I think that's, that's, I think it's more agenda. Justice. I think if we're going to do, I think if we just have a Facebook page and we start with just a the posting, it's huge. Right. This concern I heard about this particular case was Crisis Care Center did not raise as much concern as homeless shelter for drug addicts and alcoholics would have. Right. And it's all your perception of what you hear. So the regulations on this case only had, in our zoning bylaw, crisis care only. And that means almost nothing to anybody, but it's what the zoning regulations had to buy. Well, I'll say it across the board. When I talked to a couple of the board members, that's the persona I got from. If this is a crisis care, some thought this was for families and people. Yeah. That's what the persona was, and that's what it was maybe throughout the town. It wasn't a homeless shelter. You know, that's two totally different definitions. Well, it's not even It's that. not, it's, really. It's, it's elevated but up a little bit. Really just, have on that's the way they go on their website. You go out, you go on their website. That's what they advertise it as versus. Yeah. Yeah. So we the, have to at some point. No, it's a, good, it's a good case study. So having that outreach mm -hmm. and having it more available to people, we don't do that now because we don't have that. So, but in 2022, the select board did adopt a social media policy that anticipated going there. Mm -hmm. So it is totally within your control to come up with a very short protocol, which is, and Justin and I have talked about the rules of procedure. So he's working with the planning commission to update their rules of procedure to say, what do we do about this video um, you know, remote? Right. Do we... Well, like the DRB used to post video and now they're not video. And they said, we don't want to do video. Anymore. Right. So, well, do you want to do live stream on YouTube of every meeting? And people are really up to speed if they're into it because and I think Town of Jericho does every committee. Right. If you're having a public meeting, you are totally accessible. To I think YouTube. it should be done myself. I mean, it, it's, 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 well, let's, let's, let's look at the last couple months with the DRB board and us. Yeah, we don't make the DRB decisions, but we're getting all the backlash, and that's what I'm coming down to. I know she doesn't want to talk about. It, I know that I'm just saying, plain and simple, if we're getting slapped in the face of this, I want to. I want to. I came here to do this job to serve the people to do the best. That's what I came here for. I didn't come here because of any personal statue or anything that I'm. I came here, and I'm learning every day. I say that all the time, but it's the true facts. You know, like half the people in that room stopped by my house or knocked on my door or called me. You know, and. It does suck, you know, to be, I couldn't inform them with anything. So I, but they're looking at me like I'm supposed to have answers. Right. I heard it tonight when someone was looking at me and say, how come the, the board? And yes, we're saying, well, the DRB board approved that. And nobody, nobody knows that. And that's what the problem is. There's a disconnect. We we have zoning. Most towns don't have, we, we can only collaborate with Morseville in that factor because Johnson doesn't have it. He doesn't have it. All these other towns don't have it. It is all there. 
select board members, not a DRB board and select board. Yeah, and you have you have specific roles to play. In other words, the DRB is appointed by the select board to do that job, right? An issue of permit. The select board is a party to appeals at a very narrow window of opportunity under state law, which is if the DRB didn't follow this uh, bylaw or violated the town plan that said no house, no homeless shelters in Hyde Park, and they went ahead and approved those kind of obvious conflicts. Mm -hmm. Right. They didn't do any of that. And there's nothing that prohibits what the crisis care center is allowed in zoning. Mm -hmm. So it'd be a hard hill for the select board to try to get party status and appeal. Not saying that you can't ask that question at this point of the town attorney, but it's something I could answer. So that's what that's you do play a role in that. Right. You, well, you can't you can't avoid that. Right. Some of the people that had conversations with you, I think, picked some of that wording out of you. And now they're coming to me and saying, How come the select board isn't appealing this? Select board isn't appealing this. So they've got that in their head, and now I'm I know I but, feel like just like you just said, the we should have the attorney look into it. So we see what the not that we're going to do it. I'm just saying that so we're educated on the on the fact of what we can or can't do. And if the attorney says we can't do it or we don't have any leg to stand on, heat's off us. Right. And it's not even about heat as much as it is plain and simple. At least we're doing our due diligence yeah, to the taxpayers exactly. and what they're asking or what they're not asking. I don't know. Exactly. They not a, not a one of them asked us to appeal it. I think they've asked him. We didn't, did they? No, they they all came to complain, and not one of them asked us what they wanted us to do. Why? They just wanted to complain. Why don't, don't they want to? Be, why don't they want to be on camera? Who? Yeah, I'm going they, back to the DRB. They, can we select yeah. board? Say, every yes. committee has to has to record. I think you. Idea. I think you can in at the risk of losing the volunteers. That's how is the DRB is the DRB volunteered? Yeah. Yeah, and there's an open seat. No, just that's the reality. No. Yeah, but I don't. I don't. I, I think the DRB. I think the DRB. Can be public. It should be public. Yeah, that was, that, yeah. that's big enough. Absolutely. If they don't want to be recorded, they can. If you're willing to stand up and speak for our town people, because that's what you're doing. I mean, I'm gonna. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go on board here because. We're literally fighting two ends of the spectrum. A couple weeks ago, we were fighting a business owner who was looking to work on Saturdays. And it wasn't good for one tax owner, essentially. It was not good for them on a Saturday morning. That's really what it came down to. And now you've got a whole community of people saying, this isn't good for me neither. And it's- Don't be scared. Right. Yes. But I, I, you know, you heard the community, the people saying, why was I invited to that? You know, the, right. and they didn't know. And so it's the more communication, the better, I believe. Right. So it's something when you have a top down approach to that, yeah. that each of the boards should be following that. Exactly. You don't have to have a heavy hand, but you can say, right. here's what we expect. Make sure it happens in the next year. Exactly. You know, something like that. Right. And then people can decide if they want to play by those sort of guidance rules. Yeah. The other, the second issue to how the boards run, right, is what Justin does or what I do during the course of our normal business and how do we get that word out. And do we maintain a, a town Facebook page that says, uh, you know, application uh, the is warrant for this day or whatever? Uh, I've tried to do that a little bit with select board agendas where there's a list of things like uh, Savannah, you know, it's like, hey, new new member running for office, you should be getting a few agendas. So I'll just, you know, copy Savannah on that. And I'll do that, but it's not a, a oh, center road, all of center road should get a handwritten no, an extra notice on a DRB hearing. That that's not required by state law, and it is sort of up to each individual member to to you know sort of know what's going on in the neighborhood a little bit. But you're not going to know if you're working eighty hours a week, that's and right. all of a sudden you come home and there's a neighbor saying, "Don't you know?" <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, but pay, I, but like I the DRB, the DRB, the DRB, for example, Justin takes minutes for them, right? Mm -hmm. How hard would it be for that meeting to be publicized? You know, it's not like it's a committee where the committee has is hosting the whole meeting and doing the minutes and everything else. Well, how you do it. So right now you have an agenda posted, you have uh, minutes after, you have notice in the paper. Yeah. But that's a lot of stuff that people look, look right. at. Right. So what what what's the method to know who's the audience and how do you reach them? Correct. That's that's the bigger point. And then when you say we we here's what we do, if you want to know it, you have to look at the every edition of the news and citizen. Because that's the only. This is what you're going to decide after town meeting. Then, what is your official news, newspaper of notice? Every public notice goes in the News and Citizen. And if you decide not to look at the online version or the paper version, Correct. you are going to miss meetings. Yes, I agree. Mm -hmm. So, how much more do you do than that? That's 
Overtime. Unless we social media throw Facebook and then it just yeah, a few yeah, advertising, right. but then it, it that goes on, it could go on forever. There's a lot, and, of and the other thing you're going to have with that is every town person complaining about every little thing. Exactly, you can thing. make it so people can't yeah. comment. Okay. Well, I think I, I think that's a good I idea. Think we do. I think we should because I think that's our face. This, right. this is an announcement page, not 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 a it's not a conversation. Page, not a form. Yeah. This is an announcement page. Exactly, because look at the difference, yeah. and I think that is fair. Yes, you know, right. the DRB is How having you do a about, Facebook. and there it is. You can hey, let's let's be honest. Paper. Not everybody has has the, 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 the available the resource paper. to get to the paper. Maybe yeah. they don't have the way to the money, or maybe they don't have a phone to read the paper. And again, you're busy, and I'm not saying throw that more on you, but we have a resource. I don't know. I just, no, it's definitely doable. It's something we want to think about and not lose the um, commitment to it because people will get used to it. And all of a sudden, you don't do you get that much. one thing you miss, and yeah. you send someone over the edge. Right. <laughs> They're going to rely on it. Yeah. But I think if it's as simple as agendas and meetings, uh, agendas and minutes, yeah, yeah, that's correct. pretty. It's a two point. Yes, yeah, I mean, I think it. I think the agenda and the minutes would kind of it kind of throws it out there. Here, this is what's going to be discussed. This, I mean, it would. I think it because the DRB it encapsulates it. The DRB has an agenda. Exactly. This is what's happening. It's been renowned. And then people can look the day ahead. Same thing. You send it Friday up before. That gives people three days to say, "Oh, I'm going to attend that meeting." Right. Or and the DRB is there? Is there a way? Is, is there a way to zoom in? No, because it's not being recorded. No, because you call in to the It's available to zoom in. Okay. Oh, it's okay. so that's hard. recorded and put yeah. on which is that option as a board without direction from the selector. Yeah, I think in the future there really should be put on there. So it's a two prong approach: how the it, boards it, operate, and how we get the word out. It was kind of a two thing process that you work on. Yeah. You, you, and you mentioned this last meeting. I'm just going to saw this on the meeting minutes again. You're leaving in June. Uh, that's for executive session. Okay. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I just want to make sure that well, all the members session. here at all, and there's a conversation as to what well, second session. Okay. No, that was part of the that was part of the yep. discussion last meeting, but there's no okay. talk. Okay. Right. So let's I'm, let's go with the warrant to get those. Uh, okay. I think you got. That. Everybody yeah, looked at them, right? Oh, so I move to accept the warrants. Second. Okay. All in, uh, any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. No, I have aye. an objection. Opposed? I think it's sort of different in a way. It's like we're going to pay. Oh, it. true. And that's for that's Valerie's. No, no, no. This is this is the whole issue. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the, just so people know that you know the. Hyde Park Water and Light as uh, the Village Water and Light has settled with um, the county. They've come up with a with a resolution. So when it first came out, they the the village was directing people that you could go to their website and figure out what you owed. Well, I gave up on that pretty fast. So I asked Ron. So Ron sent me a one page memo, and I couldn't understand the memo. So I said, "Okay, <laughs> how do you figure out what you owe if you're in here?" Because I was I was trying to figure out particularly for the you know, for the fire department. So now it's all figured out. And here we have this, um, I guess, sort of simply in a yeah. way, what we're in under the settlement that we are, our fire department, just this is just here, the fire department is going to pay about $15,000 a year for the pleasure of being hooked up. And which then, is a 700% increase. Yeah, which is probably better than 1400% increase, sure. but there you go. Um, and and then there's the water usage as well on top of it, uh, right? On, on top of it, and so we go back to ARPA and we get some wells drilled over there and eliminate the problem. Well, one but one of the things that I asked Ron to check with our lawyer because, um, because of the, the commitment to the, being no, to, well, to see if the village has, um. If they can still argue that we have to pay even though we disconnect and drill a well and aren't using it. And Roland's not, not in his head, we do. Fire hydrants. How come? Access really? Them. Because them are our fire hydrants and they're that's what we access if we get a fire in the village. We're going to draw water from the fire hydrants out there. Oh. Is there, can we ask the attorney to see if it's a loophole? Well, he's smarter than I am, but I can <laughs> tell you. You're going to get a fire in that village. You're going to use their water, right? And I don't care how you get around it. 
Yeah, you're going to use Regardless, water, attorney, but you're doing it to, just to prevent the plane from burning it, down. Right. Based on, the only on, thing on this is a taxpayer I'm, question. Obviously, it's a $15,000 increase to the taxpayer. So I think we bring it to the attorneys. But, and have but it. Roland, aren't we just being billed for what's used at the fire department, not at the other hydrant? Yeah. Hey, there's not none of them fire hydrants down there metered. No. Yeah. If you use any hydrant in the village, it's not metered. Right, there's one on downtown. So how do they What's determine that? the, the only one that's metered is the one that goes into the fire department. Right. There's one down and back when I was on the fire department, we've almost drained that thing up there with the fires in the village. The reservoir above your place. Right. Yeah. Oh, okay. Big place too. Right beside the store there when that guy oh. right. yep. yep. lost his life there. Anyhow, so so as a board, do you want it, Ron, to ask the attorney to look into that? Well, the only thing he can do, but I can tell you, you're going to be quite or the wrong battle. well available, and what what would it, what would it mean for our taxpayers? Yeah. are the taxpayers just because the county voted on it, and our taxpayers at the hands of yes. the burden? That's what it comes down to. Yeah. So, That's so, our job, right? <laughs> so, yeah. So we're going to get in the battle here. Okay, you get a fire Again? in the village. Don't use our water. No, no. No, I don't, I don't think that's a bad one at all. Just how reasonable is it? If the fire engine would move a mile north, we would still be charged 15,000 miles. You know, it doesn't matter where the fire station is. They're going to have their own little bill because they're connected to the building water. Right. The use of the village water, which is a so totally separate thing. Uh, when we had this issue years ago in, in Richmond, there was a debate, and the fire department went to the voters. They didn't want to pay any, they didn't want to meter the hydrant as they were using it. The village wanted to uh, understand the quantity. So the voters voted to pay the fire department for the privilege of accessing those hydrants that Roland's talking about, a said dollar amount every year. And their per usage fee at the fire station went down because of that. Because that agreement that made it so that it was a set for, yeah. Yes, yeah, so that's one way. The, the village's fee is based on how many people are served by the fire department? How many people are served by the county courthouse? It, it just has nothing to do with water usage. It's right. the customer base, right. which is a new formula. And the next question is, how long are we on the hooks for this? Right? Yeah. right. Is that on? Every, oh. Yeah, it's going to keep going up. Yeah. yeah. But once their, once their three. note is paid, it's not, it doesn't. Not going back. They have other notes in the queue. Does that ever work before you for you? As, in the yeah. I've never heard water here. I wish. Well, you got village water up town garage. Yep. That's a complicated story. They just take it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just saying it's yeah. you're opening up a can of words. Yeah. So we just pay it. That's a good thing. That's a lot. That's funny. Like I said, I, I think it's worth the research. I think, yeah, yeah, I think, they, I think the legal issue should be settled because otherwise you're shooting in the dark a little bit right. about what your right. what your options are. Right. You, you have the practical advice for Roland, but you you're still operating without the legal advice of the town. And mine didn't cost nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it send a bill. <laughs> it, it, it's averaging about thirteen cents an hour right now. No, it's it's an all right now. <laughs> yeah, I think we're an all right now. <laughs> Anyhow, so okay. are we going to, do we want to go into executive session? I have one really quick thing. It's written. Just yep. To it yep. It's the update on the, uh, the flood buyout over at uh, North High Park at 100 C. The what? Flood? The flood buyout grant that you approved last uh, couple of months ago. I think it might be more. This Which, is the DeMar property? Yeah, DeMar and I at 100 C. Yeah. See that, guys? I'm remembering yeah, yeah. things. Good job, Matt. And it's yeah. after eight. Yeah, that's, okay. that's pretty good. So this, <laughs> this is, uh, I put the little image on there just so you know that where the hollow property relates to 100 C in the river. Mm -hmm. But the rest of it is from the state um, Department of Public Safety, who's managing the grant with FEMA office. And I think they're in Washington, I don't know if where he has to mm -hmm. approval, but. The application was submitted as a voluntary participation with both landowners signing their names to a paper that said this is voluntary. Once that paper was signed and the application submitted, the grant starts going through. The town at that point can't condemn the property by end of the domain if we don't come to a um, negotiated settlement. Yeah. If we do come to a negotiated settlement, then the property has to be cleaned and turned to open space, fishing access, public parking, or whatever. 
uh, can't be sold for commercial purposes and such, community purposes. Yeah. So that that gives you the timeline of the FEMA timeline of month or two, month or two, month or two. It just keeps going. So that, that's why I want to give it to you. Just like it's yeah. it's nothing we can control. It's a process of waiting for the next step. That's all. Yeah, good luck with that. Um, okay. But did we want to go into an executive, executive session? We want to discuss yeah. Ron's retirement. Yeah. <laughs> Turns <laughs> Turns <laughs> and Still on speak. <laughs> I got nothing to do. We need a motion to go into the Oh, I'll make a motion. Do we need to make a motion? We do, right? Yeah, sure do. I'll make a motion to go into executive session for personnel. personnel. Recording stopped. Favor. See if I'm saying aye. 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 Matt. Aye. It's a good point Savannah just had, which is the, the select board technically would have to invite people into an executive session or say people have to leave. So that if there's somebody, okay. if there's somebody else here, you should do that as a procedural thing. And uh, actually, okay. I think we should invite her. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So come on up here. Yeah, come sit with us. Kind yeah, of get used to it. <laughs> so if you're headed into this board, this is something you're going to want to remember. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You got a good opening tonight. Oh, hey, real you know? yeah. Don't you work for that? So okay, we so need to come out of the executive session. And then um, that's it. Yeah. Motion to adjourn. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh no. We can we can outline. We're we're going to set a petition. We're going to start looking forward to setting for petition for right. the town administrator. Yes. With looking at the, everything else. It's an ongoing process. Every meeting yes. have to have yes. a discussion with sure everybody stays on track. Yeah. Yep. Eventually, we'll have a agreement of something. So all in favor, taking fight by saying aye. I woke him up. <laughs> um, March 8th is right. the next meeting. Correct. Yes. But this room is booked from 5 to 8 for somebody. Okay. So we can't have it here. Really so we so 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 want to do it Thursday night instead? No. Or no. Because you're gone, right? Yeah. Well, I leave here at 6 o'clock Friday morning. So no, you're not saying Thursday night. Then. Which I'd be squeezing up. upstairs in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. and then, that's a coat. Yeah, we can go to the okay. kitchen. Yeah, we've done that. Okay, so six. So when sure. finally that? It'd be yeah. March six is Monday. Yeah, that's a public hearing for the bond. We have to do right. that. That's limited agenda. Yeah, do that six o'clock, and then you're you yeah. show up, close town meeting day, and and you're done that. Day. Yeah, wait, we have we have a meeting March six. Public the informational meeting. type answering questions, so we don't have to do it on the. Okay, you were talking. I am sorry. We, we, are we showing up to now? A you know, <laughs> you, you can, but if you don't make it, it's not the end of the world. Okay. Because the last one we did on this, nobody else showed up. Did we have an agenda on this? Will that get Friday? Friday. You'll send me on something Friday. Yeah, yeah. it's different. Normal, it's a normal schedule of Monday at six. Not normal. I've had it in Vegas, middle of the week. All right, we'll send some town funds and see how you do. So we can you double our money worth? <laughs> so all in favor of adjourning? I thought we did that. Oh, uh, he didn't have it up in yeah. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, no. yes. Anybody opposed? Anything? There you go. Thank you. Thank you.